Good evening, all. Okay, I'm going to call the meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals to order, and I'm going to read the call of the meeting. <clears throat> Published in the Hartford Current, March 22nd and March 28th, Zone 6, Legal Notice, Town of Bloomfield, Zoning Board of Appeals. Notice is hereby given that the Zoning Board of Appeals will conduct public hearings at a meeting on April 4th, 2022, commencing at 7.30 p.m. via the Zoom platform to consider the following. One, application by Paul Benny for a variance request from section 3.7.B of the Bloomfield zoning regulations to allow a proposed detached garage to exceed 15 feet in height at 112 Terrettville Road in an R40 zone. Application by Global Tech Design LLC for variance requests from section 4.5.C of the Bloomfield zoning regulations to allow a front yard setback of 17 feet where 25 feet is the minimum front yard setback required. To construct a second entrance on the front of structure located at 3 Park Avenue in a GWD zone. A full copy of the applications are available for inspection at the planning office at Town Hall. Application material is also available on the Zoning Board of Appeals mm -hmm. section of the town's website. At this meeting, interested persons may be heard virtually. Uh, may be heard and written communication, sorry, received information for how to attend the meeting virtually will be published in on the website, a minimum of 24 hours before the meeting dated at Bloomfield, Connecticut, the 22nd day of March, 2022. Zoning Board of Appeals, Shirley Williams, Secretary, Jacqueline Isaacson, Chair. Okay, and then we have the application uh, which is not on here, that was continued, correct? First on the agenda. Okay, Let me, give me one second here. I have a feeling that Shirley's having a problem getting in again because I have a text. Um, maybe. Shirley's trying to get in. She's been on since seven o'clock and she's not, she's using the link that was sent, the link was coming from Jose. Um, well, she was logged in earlier um, and I promoted her as a panelist. I'm not sure she probably logged back out. Um, I can, surely I can send you a link again, just do it through the agenda um, and, and I can just promote you. Okay. I'll do that. All right, so the first, um, application is um, the, uh, the appeal of two brothers LLC from a cease and desist order regarding non-compliance with previous, previously issued special exception approval conditions, failure to renew special exception vehicle storage in a manner not approved by PZC section 6.11 overnight vehicle storage not within a building section 4.1.d so who is uh here for that applicant uh, ken slater attorney at halloran and sage uh representing the applicant my clients indicate that they're on as well but i don't know whether uh on my list of participants they are not so i don't know whether or not they needed to be uh, granted panelists, they registered and received a, uh, an email that, that came from, um, they, uh, Mr. They, Geiner. they are in attendance, um, on, on the web, on the webinar. I see. All it. right. And will they be able so to be able to ask them questions? I can allow them. Would you like me to allow them to speak right now? Uh, just, I'm not sure how the chair would operate on an enforcement appeal. Some some commissions do it differently. We would hear from the enforcement officer first, and and others would hear from the appellant first. But if we're going to make our presentation, I, I would need him uh, available. Excuse me, um, point of order, Jackie. 
I see that Shirley's on as an attendee. Um, okay, so familiar. so Linda needs to uh, upgrade her to a panelist. Right. Thank you. And I, I, and I think the owners are there too. They're here now. Okay, okay. Did you, do you have to um, upgrade them to panelists also mm -hmm. so they can talk? Well, they don't need to talk quite yet. Thank you. Oh, good, Shirley. We already. Thank I, you I, very I, much. I read okay, the call you. of the meeting. I, I, yeah, I heard you. Okay. All right. All right. So um, I think um, for purposes of this meeting, is it Seth that's sitting or Jennifer that's going to be voting? Uh, Linda, do you have a record from? whose turn it is, just so people know ahead of time. I don't have the, the latest record of who went last, but you can appoint either one um, at this point. No, did either of you vote last meeting? It was but Jennifer. It was Jennifer, okay, so then it's Seth tonight. Um, wait, 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 T I'm sorry. Tiffany was the one that voted. Oh. No, she voted last, sorry. Oh, Jennifer. okay, not Jennifer. Okay, no. so you guys can flip a coin <laughs> and decide which one of you is going to go go for tonight. Um, so usually we do listen um, to the zoning enforcement officer uh, first. That's how we've always uh, done our meeting here. Yes. Okay. Well, good evening, uh, board members. Thank you for your time tonight, Linda Loriano, uh, Town of Bloomfield Zoning Enforcement Officer. Um, I am uh, now first, do you, did you all receive uh, the copy of the, um, the memorandum or the report uh, at the last meeting? I know it was postponed to this public hearing date uh, per the applicant's request and uh, the board granted them an extension on May 7th, uh, well, a postpone, a po to postpone the meeting to this date. Um, do you all have a copy? I, can. I have a copy of the letter dated March 7th that okay. was signed by uh, Attorney Slater. Okay, I will uh, share screen with you as I uh, present uh, the summary of the case um, and a timeline of event uh, that led to the cease and desist order. Oh, that's not what I want. One moment. Uh, are you able to see the screen? Not yet. No. 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 Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Right. okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to go uh, through the. Uh, so, originally, um, I, I'm the newly appointed, as you're aware, uh, the new enforcement officer um, as of uh, January 3rd, um, appointed by the Planning and Zoning uh, Commission at a special meeting. Um, and uh, prior uh, to my appointment, we had uh, Michael D'Amato, who was serving as the uh, acting zoning enforcement officer for the town of Bloomfield. Um, on November 19th, the planning and zoning department received a complaint mm -hmm. regarding the property at 56 Tunxis Avenue. Uh, the property is approximately 0.86 acres in size and is located within, within the Bloomfield Center District BCD zone. The complaint was related to the total number of vehicles on the property. According to the town records on June 5th, and as I go, I'm, I'm reading uh, the report uh, on June 5th, 1989, the property was issued a special exception approval from ZBA to conduct an automo automo automotive related use. The approval was issued with four specific conditions related to the location and quantity of vehicles of the, on the property. Exhibit one, I'm gonna go back and forth on this one as we can, that is the special exception that was granted um, 
on May 2nd, 1989. I'm sorry, June 5th, 1989. Uh, that was just the date that, uh, that they had asked for the special exception. Um, so on June 5th, 1989, they were granted the exception with four specific conditions. So the conditions of approval granted by the Zoning Board of Appeals to Russell P. Williams of 56 Texas Avenue on June 5th, 1989 were as follows. Not more than 14 vehicles to be displayed, six on the south side, eight on the north side, to the front of the station. No sign shall be posted on the vehicles or building except for a sticker or warranty no larger than eight and a half inch by 11 inch. No more than 25 vehicles are permitted on the site to be offered for sale. The special exception shall be valid for two years and subject to the renewal of the board at the end of the two years. Those were the four specific conditions uh, pointed out in exhibit one. I will continue. Please bear with me. Section 611 outside storage of, of registered vehicle as well as section 41D for JJ special permit uses in the BCD zone. Um, following a review of the 1989 approval, the above reference zoning regulations, a site inspection was conducted on December 13th, 2021 by Mike D'Amato, which indicated the following. Indicating more than 25 vehicles on the west side of the property, exhibit two. I will go to that in a minute. Um, photo on the building frontage, Texas Avenue, with more than 10 vehicles within the photo frame. That's right on the frontage. And to the east side of the property, indicating more than 14 vehicles within the photo frame. Just want to point out these three pictures because the special condition. Okay, making everyone dizzy here with us. God bless you. Thank you. All right. All right, this is the north. I believe this is, um, if I can change this orientation so it's uh, better visible for you. Oh, it's gonna be really hard. Oh, here it is. Oh, it's not allowing me to rotate. You know, it is in our packet from last month though. Can you see it? Okay. So this orientation here uh, points out to the north, uh, the condition. Uh, six on the south, eight on the north side to the front of the station. This is the condition one, uh, not more than eight vehicles on this side. And as you see, uh, we have a photo here indicating uh, that was taken December 13th of more than eight vehicles on the north side. Additional vehicles on the frontage. <coughs> And, and to the east. I'm sorry, and to the south, uh, six vehicles, not more than six vehicles. And as you can see, we have over, I believe it was estimated to be over 14 vehicles. So six on this side, eight on the other. That was the approval. And uh, not more than 25 vehicle on the site and the rest being in the rear. And I'm going back to the, uh, the report here as we're following through. I just showed you exhibit two, three, and four. Those were the pictures of the vehicles. In the rear portion of the property, it was also viewed from the plaza at 40 Tunxis Avenue. There was a parking lot there and a commercial property. Um, the zoning officer, Mike D'Amato at the time, uh, 
indicated that there were at least 40 additional vehicles being stored in the rear of the property. <coughs> I also informed you that on September 23rd, 2021, the property owners did obtain a town plan approval by the planning and uh, by the Plan and Zone Commission for automotive repair and sale at 15 Highland Park Drive, um, which was to expand their operations uh, for additional, additional location. I believe that as of this moment, um, this date, no proposal, even though they did receive um, the special permit, uh, no proposal to to work on there, it's, it's, it's pretty much a vacant lot um, at this time. There has been no approval file for the associated permits uh, for that site. So uh, subsequently, based on the uh, file review and the site inspection, a notice of violation uh, was issued December 17th, 2021. Uh, a notice of receipt was received. Um, so the applicant or uh, the property owner did receive uh, the warning notice. Um, they were given 50 days to 15 days to bring the property into compliance, um, which the compliance, the order was, I believe it was exhibit, um, exhibit five, the notice of violation. Sorry, just bear with me here. It, it's in here. <clears throat> Number 17, this is it, Exhibit 5, Notice of Violation Warning Letter. Property owner uh, and the agent um, were made aware of, of the site inspection and also of the findings. Um, and the violation warning letter uh, actually pointed out uh, that there were four conditions to their June 5th, 1989 approval, which was the last approval that they special exception they received of not having more than 14 vehicles to be displayed, which was six on the south and eight on the north. And you both saw the exhibits of those as well as the frontage. Um, with, as far as signage, they were in compliance. Um, however, not more than 25 vehicles on the site to be offered for sale. We don't know the exact amount, but we definitely uh, you know, could see that there were a substantial amount of, of 40 vehicles, possibly more on the site. Um, and, uh, and the photos, uh, you know, you could see that in, in the photograph. I'm not sure if anyone uh, drove by, but I did drive by today. Um, it doesn't look like there were any vehicles removed. Um, it did seem like there were a few more vehicles in the front of the property um, and uh, the back of the property. I'm not sure how cars get around there, uh, but there was a substantial amount of, of vehicles in the back. Um, so you have the four conditions here. Um, again, the, the violation hell? indicated that there were more than 35 vehicles in the front, um, which was uh, pretty accurate um, according to the photos and site inspections. So they, have, uh, they were found in violation of their special exception of 1989, granting them the 14 vehicles for display and not more than 25 vehicles on site. They were also found in violation of the current zoning regulations, uh, which indicate that on um, section 41D4JJ, where uh, in the BCD zone. Uh, it says, make sure. It doesn't see you, so make sure you. I'm definitely here. I'm sorry. They need to be muted. Hold on one moment. I can speak when it's their turn. Thank you. 
the green field zoning regulations, uh, which indicate that uh, no storage, and I can cite you the, the section here. Um, that section says service, repair, or storage of motor vehicles may be permitted as long as the overnight storage of all motor vehicles take place within the confines of a building. They were found in violation of section 41D4JJ of the current regulations um, and section 611, uh, which is the outside storage of motor vehicles um, where buffer requirements and uh, the indicated amount uh, more than what is permitted would be subject to the approval of the town plan uh, and zone commission, but they have not been back for any uh, approvals um, or any amendment or variance uh, or special uh, permit. Actually, uh, if, if, they, if they wanted to add more vehicles, they would have to come back to the plan and zoning commission to uh, ask for a special permit. Um, to allow uh, for more vehicles uh, for the plan, if that was their intention. They were then directed to remove all the vehicles which were located on the property in access of what was approved in 1989, special exception by the Zoning Board of Appeal, or submit a new complete application to the Planning and Zoning Department seeking approval to conduct activity on the site in accordance with the current conditions uh, within 50 days of the issuance. So as you can see, uh, they were given a choice of either complying or coming in uh, to seek approval uh, according to the current site conditions and regulations. Subsequently, um, I'm gonna go back. They were Linda, yep. Linda, yeah. did they ever comply with D? Did they come back two years later? Uh, no, they have not. My understanding was that they did not. They, they sought a, a special permit for a different site as an expansion. Um, and, and I believe that it was thought that that would relieve a lot of the overflow there um, onto the new property. Uh, that was my understanding, but um, as of this date, no permit application um, or, you know, additional approval, uh, you know, was, have been um, filed. No action has been taken by, by the applicant or, or agent on this. Um, okay, so to follow up on the uh, on the non-compliance on January 21st, 2022, um, a cease and desist order, um, I'm sorry, on January 24th. Um, um, let's see, a cease and desist order was issued. That was exhibit nine. Um, that was subsequent to a follow-up inspection on January 21st, which showed um, again, uh, vehicles still appeared and it appeared to have increased in number of vehicles on the property, um, which are in exhibit six, seven, and eight, which are attached to this report as well. Um, the cease and desist order was uh, sent January 24th um, and uh, received by the agent January 26th. The application was received in our office on in February 4th appealing the decision of the uh, zoning enforcement officer of cease and desist order. Um, so we just, you know, do want to point out, um, you know, based on the review, um, you know, they are in violation of the special exception approval of 1989, having excessive amount of vehicle on the property. Um, they're also in violation of the regulations, our current regulations, uh, section 41D4JJ, 
uh, where a service repair or storage of motor vehicles may be permitted as long as uh, they're stored overnight uh, inside of, of the building. Um, that would be also an authorized through a special permit application, which again, we have not received. And the outside storage of uh, registered vehicles, which indicates you know, anything in excess of what they were granted um, or is permitted on the site uh, as far as buffers and, and, and the layout would be uh, approval by the Town Plan Commission. So um, based on a review of the above zoning regulations and 1989 CBA special exception approval, it is the opinion, uh, I am reading again, Mike D'Amato's uh, comments uh, of the town of Bloomfield if this property is in violation of their previously issued approval, both through non-compliance with the conditions and also, um, you know, uh, non-compliant, uh, still till this day, remain non-compliant with the amount of vehicles on the property um, and non-compliant with, with said section current regulations. Um, so I'm open to any questions that you may have at this time. Madam Chair. Um, yes, uh, Attorney Needleman. Hi, Mark Needleman, town attorney uh, speaking. I have some additional background, which I'd like to provide to the board and uh, the applicant and their counsel um, in terms of more recent events, uh, starting in February, 2019. On right. February 28, 2019, the owner, then owner, asked the TPZ to allow additional vehicles uh, to be placed on the property. There was discussion and uh, no action was taken. Uh, the minutes seemed to suggest, uh, although they aren't terribly detailed, seemed to suggest that the uh, commission didn't feel there was anything for them to take action on. That was February, 2019. In July, 2019, July 29th, a cease and desist order issued same violations that are before you tonight. Uh, there was no response. And on January 27th, 2020, so a little more than two years ago, we had our first court hearing. It was continued to February 20, 2020 for a subsequent hearing. There were discussions between council and myself in an effort to uh, resolve the matter. Um, on March 25th, 2020, there was a further proceeding in court. It was continued at the request of the owner uh, who represented they were making uh, great efforts to resolve the matter. On July 8th, 2020, there was a joint request, joint meaning the owner and the town, request for a continuance to September 10th to allow the owner to acquire a new site uh, with the representations being made to the town that that would allow them to cure the violation. Hence our agreement for the continuance to September 10th. At September 10th, there was a hearing and the parties reached an agreement which they indicated would be drawn up and submitted to the court. That stipulated agreement, um, which the zoning officer has in her file, and I've provided to counsel uh, for the owners, uh, was approved by the court on October 7, 2020. Um, that included the issuance of a injunction against the owners and joining them or ordering them to not violate the town zoning laws, in particular, uh, the matters uh, that were the subject of the action, and to be more specific, the conditions of the approval, as well as any other zoning regulations. And that would include um, the one you heard tonight about inside storage and outside storage. 
approved by the court on October 7th, 2020. And it also included uh, a provision of daily fines for every day that the agreement, the stipulated judgment uh, was not adhered to. Um, and it would be my position to you tonight that uh, the owner has not complied on any of those days since the uh, October 7, 2020 approval. December 17, 2021, a notice of violation was sent by the zoning officer to the agent for service of the owner. Let me back up actually on September 23rd, 2021, the TPZ approved the special permit for auto sales and repairs at the 15 Highland Drive, Park Drive that you heard mentioned by the zoning officer. And again, that was supposed to be, according to the owner, um, their way of uh, ensuring compliance for the Tunxus Avenue property. No application has been submitted to date to the town for site plan approval or for construction at that site since the September 23rd approval. Following on December 17th, there was a notice of violation letter sent by the zoning officer to the agent for service. No response. December 13th, there was a site inspection by staff. Property was not in compliance with the permit or the terms of the stipulated judgment. Still no communication from the owner. January 21st, 2022, follow-up inspection, which you just heard of. There appeared to be more cars than before. January 24th, 2022, cease and desist was delivered to the agent for service for the owners. And as you know, on March 7th, uh, subsequent to the uh, appeal being filed, uh, the owner requests and obtained a continuance until tonight. Um, it is my recommendation that you not uh, take any action or proceed on the basis of any uh, failure to renew the permit. Um, there's some question as to whether or not that would currently be a valid uh, term and condition of a special permit. And I would recommend that for tonight's purposes, uh, you proceed with the what I'll call the physical violations uh, on the site if you deem them to be uh, present. I'm available uh, to answer any questions. Um, Linda, can you show that stipulation for judgment on the screen? One moment. Just bear with me. I'm while you're doing that, let me explain a, a stipulation for judgment is an agreement. And in this case, it was an agreement that the parties, both the town and the owners entered into a stipulated agreement. And the parties submitted that to the superior court for its review and approval, asking that the stipulation be approved, be granted, and entered as an order of the court. And that's in fact what did take place. Um, I am gonna share the screen now, one moment. This is the stipulated agreement that attorney Needleman is referring to. Can you all see? Okay, so briefly, I'll, I'll read it because it's rather small here. Yeah, thank you. Um, dated October 6, 2020, the parties agree that judgment may enter in favor of the plaintiff, Michael Casilla, who was the zoning officer for the town of Bloomfield against the defendant, Two Brothers Auto LLC, as follows. One, a permanent injunction, meaning it's not temporary, it's indefinite going forward, permanent, may issue in joining the defendant and its principles, the defendant being the owner and its principles from violating the terms of the special permit, permit issued for the subject property. 
the defendant and its principles will strictly comply with all the terms of the existing special exception granted for the subject property 56 Tunxus Avenue in 1989, as well as other zoning regulations related to the subject property. Three, the defendant shall pay to the town care of the town attorney, the sum of $2,000 as reimbursement for costs incurred by the town on or before October 28th. And that was complied with. And four, the defendant shall pay to the town of Bloomfield the sum of $250 per day for each day that the defendant fails to comply with the permanent injunction. Notwithstanding this provision, the plaintiff shall not be barred from seeking additional or other relief. Um, and certainly the current action uh, can be deemed uh, additional or other relief. That's, that's the history. If you have any questions on that, I can try to answer them. Um, but between the CEO and myself, I think you have a pretty good background. And my recommendation would be that uh, the owners through their counsel, if they have any questions they'd like to pose, that they certainly be allowed uh, to do that. And then if they have something that they'd like to present, uh, they certainly should be afforded that opportunity. And um, of course, staff uh, can always ask questions either of the zoning officer, myself, or of attorney Slater, or the owners or anyone else for that matter who has information bearing on the subject. Thank you for, for the um, Alan has a question yeah. right now. Go ahead, yeah. Alan. So Attorney Needleman, are you saying that they're in violation? They owe $250 a day since October of 2020? That would be my position and I will be pursuing that matter as well independently what, of What does that calculate this. out to? <laughs> I haven't done the math yet, but it's a lot of money. So typically the town can throw a lien on a property and then pursue it that way too, correct? That's a possibility. I, I have not, you know, finalized how I'm going to proceed with it. I want to see in part how this commission uh, wishes to deal with their part of it and try to do everything in once. Okay. I just want to say thank you for providing the background information. I know Attorney Needleman is uh, very well aware of, of um, the site and uh, the previous history, uh, but what we have before you tonight and what you're acting on is at the actual appeal to the cease and desist order that was recently issued. I do believe the background information uh, is great, uh, but we are here tonight uh, for the current uh, appeal to the cease and desist order that was issued um, on January 24th. Thank you. Anybody else have a question before I um, let the attorney speak? I don't, I don't see any hands. Okay, uh, attorney Slater, did you wanna present? Absolutely. Uh, before I begin, one of the things I was going to be discussing, but I think it may be moot based on Attorney Needleman's advice, uh, is the point that when a special permit is granted, uh, that you know, there, there's a question right now in the Supreme Court about whether or not a special permit can put a deadline on when work would be uh, completed on a project. Uh, but it is uh, certainly the land use treatise and, and most land use lawyers that I'm aware of are uh, believe that when a special permit is granted, the determination that it's permissible at the location is a permanent one that runs with the land. So uh, an idea that you'd have to, you know, if you granted a, a Dunkin' Donuts, a special permit to operate at a location, uh, you know, they, you know, if there were any sort of renewal uh, that you know, perhaps if there were some additional submissions, it happens with sometimes with, uh, um, quarries where there's a renewal that you come back and you present additional information, but you, there's no opportunity to ask permission a second time of whether or not the use is permitted. So uh, I think attorney, well, I know attorney Needleman advised that that issue, that is the, whether or not there's a need to come in for a renewal 
shouldn't be the basis for enforcement. And if that's the case, I won't go into detail on that and I'll just focus on the other ones. I just wanted to make sure uh, that the commission agreed with Attorney Needleman's advice and we're gonna proceed on the on, uh, what he described as the physical violations with respect to the number of, of the vehicles uh, for sale under the special permit. You wanted Mark to answer that? No, no, Mark advised you that way. And I, right, I just right. don't want to spend time on that issue if you were in agreement with his advice that uh, there seems to be a common understanding that a, a renewal of a special permit like that is not a valid condition to a, a special permit. So that we should focus on the other elements of the enforcement order. I, I also agree with Attorney Needleman on that aspect. Yes, okay. so. that's fine. Okay, then I, then I won't focus in on that. Um, I will say I'm surprised I'm, I'm here tonight. Um, and, and I had a conversation I heard from uh, Mr. D'Amato. I wasn't realizing, I didn't realize he was leaving. Uh, I represent, and my firm represents a bunch of towns. Probably a larger part of my practice is actually advising boards like yours rather than representing persons in front of boards. And my first approach when I'm on, uh, you know, Attorney Needleman's side um, or you know, Mike D'Amato and now Ms. Uh, Loriano uh, would be to look for um, a solution to resolve uh, any outstanding violations and avoid proceeding with a hearing. Uh, and that was a discussion I had with uh, Mr. D'Amato before, just before your last hearing. And, you know, we agreed we would work together on that. And that was the basis for our request for the continuance. And he and I did have conversations after that in, in one aspect that um, he was under the impression that if you had a dealer's license, you weren't allowed to, to repair, that this was strictly a, a, uh, a dealership uh, for the sale of vehicles. And I told him that I would do, you know, that that wasn't my understanding, but that I would do the additional research to provide him some additional information. I also had counseled my client when I looked at photographs that it would be very difficult for uh, someone to determine which vehicles are there for being serviced and which vehicles are there uh, for the purposes of sale. Um, and so I, I was going to make suggestions of the client, my clients in a way in which there could be some signage that would identify specifically uh, the vehicles that are there for sale and the ones that are, uh, that are not and that are they're there to, to be repaired. And uh, so uh, Mike had been very busy and what I didn't realize is that part of that was the winding up his affairs as uh, enforcement officer uh, and that or acting enforcement officer and that Ms. Loriano was going to be taking over. So uh, I got an email, I was actually in an airport, uh, went to my, my uh, middle son's uh, par spring parents weekend. I was in an airport airplane to head to Virginia when I saw that he wasn't participating because frankly, because he and I hadn't connected to go over that information. Um, I expected because we still had additional days for extension to grant that we were gonna do the exact same thing that we did last month and, and there would be continued and I, I learned that he was not there and that this hearing was going to see. So I did my best over the course of the weekend and, and today to, to prepare um, uh, my, uh, and I, I did receive from Attorney Needleman on, on Friday uh, while I, you know, while I was traveling, but then I was able to look at it over the weekend, the, uh, the order that was entered into the stipulation. And I also took I was not involved in that proceeding. Uh, this is the first time I've been involved in representing uh, the uh, the company and their principals. Um, Ken Barber was an attorney practiced out of East Hampton um, who had uh, referred this enforcement matter to me. He was the attorney who had appeared in that uh, the other proceeding. Um, and as you saw, uh, it related to the special permit that was granted. So before I begin, as Attorney Needleman said, I would have an opportunity to ask a couple of questions. Could I ask questions of uh, the enforcement officer? Sure. Uh, Ms. Loriano, do you know which vehicles in those photographs uh, that are part of the materials or vehicles that are were there uh, to be sold and which ones were there to be repaired? Uh, no, I have, there was no indication on there on those vehicles, which were for repair or which were for display. Okay. Did you see any on site that had, uh, had signage or any, 
well, I'll back up. The photographs that are part of the package were not photographs that you took, correct? That's correct. Were you with Mr. D'Amato when he did the uh, the photos that were part of the, the package that the, the board has? Uh, the second part of the photos, uh, he, I was here. I wasn't with him when he took it, but I was an employee of the town of Bloomfield, yes. That was the okay. January 21st, 2022 site inspection, uh, exhibit six, seven, and eight. Uh, those are the photos that he took. And um, I was here employed at the time, although I was not assigned. He was handling the case because he was still uh, here part-time. Okay, so you, you, you weren't with him when he took the photographs. You were, you were employed and you were on your way to becoming zoning enforcement officer, but you weren't with him at the site inspection. I was not with him at the site inspection. Okay. Now, have you reviewed the the uh, the entire file related to this site? Uh, yes, which is uh, I re what we have available. Yes, on on our web. Isn't it true that on this site there is a a lawful repair business as well as the authorization by special permit to sell vehicles? Uh, when you indicate lawful, I'm so I, I, I just want to back up a little bit. Um, I was not involved in the enforcement of the cease and desist order at the time that this happened. Uh, so I cannot say whether at the time it was lawful or not. I reviewed the case uh, recently when it was just assigned to me uh, at the end of the contract term with the zoning enforcement officer, Mike D'Amato, um, at the time. Uh, I'll try to be more specific. I isn't it true that in addition to selling vehicles, it is also lawful um, for the operation of a auto repair business that existed before any special permits were granted? Uh, the sale of automobile as well as, uh, according to the record, there is something from, I believe, 19, uh, the prior uh, special exception that they had allowed them for, I believe, car sale and some repair. Okay, are you aware that this this location was established as a car repair business because the, the town of Bloomfield took um, the property for redevelopment of a, what was then an existing repair facility in 1969 operated by Evans? Are you, are you aware of that? Um, that this was part of a redevelopment at the time? Is, is that what you're asking me if I was aware? No, no. Are, are you aware that this site became the location of a gasoline sales and repair business at the time. Um, after another location was taken by the town for redevelopment. I did read that, yes. On the record. And that goes back to 1969? I believe so. It went back to 1960. I didn't make a copy of it, but uh, I did read uh, the gasoline station, I believe two pumps. My, if my memory. Now, does the record reflect the fact that, it, that, that, that there was a point in time that the owner of the repair business wanted to get permission to also sell vehicles? Uh, I don't know also to sell vehicles along with the pump station. I believe it was part of removing that part and have some sale of, of vehicles, yes. Removing what part? Uh, the pump station afterwards, after they received their uh, special exception, I believe. Do you have anything in your file that suggests that the the approval to sell cars was related to elimination of the pumps? Uh, I, I don't recall that, you know, the connection with, you know, the relationship between the both, no. Do you have any reason to dispute the fact that there was that the special permit that's been that's been granted related only to the sale of vehicles and not to repair? Uh, 
I don't believe that it was just related to the sale. I think it was related to the overall. I, I believe that the display was for the 14 vehicles on the northern uh, of the property uh, and on the south part. Um, and they were allowed to have 25 vehicles on site. But the display of those uh, vehicles were for sale, were, were 14. Are you aware of anything in the file that limits the number of vehicles they can have on site for the purposes of repair? I would say that it's the 14 minus the 25. It would limit them for that amount. And what do you base that on? Uh, on the recent, the most recent approval uh, of the special exception of June 5th, 1989. All right. Um, Matt, Madam uh, Chair, perhaps it would be helpful for everyone if the zoning officer could display once again the conditions of approval for special June, exceptions. June, the June 5th, 1989? Is the, that what you're referring to? Madam Chair, yes. my, my presentation is going to go through several documents, which will include that. Well, I, I, I'm suggesting we display that since you're asking about it, Attorney Slater. No, actually, I was asking about the repair, but if you'd like to pull that up, that'd be great. Okay. So, yeah, the 14 vehicles to be displayed and not more than 25 on the site. So in, in the rear. Well, okay. if, you could, if you could pull it up. If I can share my screen, I have it in, in front of me. Can I do that, Ms. Lawrence? Sure, go ahead. You should have permission to, to share your screen. There you go. Can you uh, make that larger, please? I can try, know. hold on one second. I have it in front of me, but mm -hmm. <laughs> for others that might not. I am on it. That's in PowerPoint. So just bear with me because normally if I had it in a PDF, I would do it differently. Um, so just bear with me. You know, I can do it a different way. Just let me stop sharing for a second. Um, With me. All right. All right, that's all right. Does that look bigger? It does. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so here are the conditions of approval. They speak for themselves. Uh, I don't think any of us were around uh, at that meeting. Um, so it is what it is. Um, and and Council, if you have any questions, feel free to inquire. I would. Okay. Um, for the record, when you're, when you're speaking, can you just please identify yourself? For just the purposes of, of minutes or recording, sound recording. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to do that. Again, Ken Slater um, for the uh, uh, appellant. And I'd ask the zoning enforcement officer um, that it refers to modifying the special permit to allow cars to be displayed. Is that correct? That's under one. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? I'm sorry, to modify. It says modify the special permit to allow cars to be displayed as follows, correct? As follows, correct. And 
nothing in that first paragraph relates to cars on site for repair, correct? Uh, nothing refers to car repair, no. And then A says 14 vehicles to be displayed again, correct? It does say that. All right, and then the third B is the kind of signage that you'd see on the vehicles. For warranty. And then C is no more than 25 to be offered for sale, correct? That's what it says. Okay, and is it fair to say that there's nothing in any of these conditions that pertains to vehicles that are on the site that are being repaired? Is that fair to say? Uh, it's fair to say that it doesn't say that it's to be repaired, correct? All right, I'm going to try, just hope it looks large enough for you. So I'm going to try to run my PowerPoint, which was submitted earlier. All right, can you see um, what says Town of Bloomfield on the top? Yeah. All right, now, does that look really small to you? Because it, it's a document that's a PowerPoint. Yes. All right. Try to zoom in, but that doesn't work well. Council Mark Needleman uh, speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, the permit that was just displayed mm -hmm. dealt with and made special reference to the special exception granted November. 22nd 72 yeah. so why are you making reference to documents prior to that date uh, why is because the only special permit that's been obtained is relates to activities that weren't grandfathered as non-conforming uses the once the use the image that you see now but it but it's small is the 1969 document that pertains to the relocation of the service station. The service station pre-existed. The town acquired a parcel at 25 Tunxis, which was where the auto repair garage was located, not a sales operation. Uh, that was relocated. And the next page I'm, I'm showing um, is the map that shows the building, the main building in the portico of uh, back in that's this is a 1970 map this related to the repair business not a sales business uh, and then uh, it wasn't until 1972 that there was a permission to sell uh, new cars what I have from the file is in 1975 uh, they went uh, and referred back to the 1972 perm permission to sell cars and so this is uh, from 1975 
um, there was no requirement for a special permit to operate the pre-existing gas station um, and sales service. So the only thing that's referred to is permission to sell used cars. So that's referenced um, again to sell cars um, and not related to the repair. The repair goes all the way back again to 1969 um, when there was an existing gas and service repair garage, not a sales dealership. They added that element to the use uh, by special permit. Uh, and that, that aspect, that is the sales, has taken up much of the, the bandwidth of the, of the history of enforcement, uh, but the repair business pre-existed it. And again, so this refers to 1975 um, and the sale of used cars for the, con for the convenience of the customers of the service station. This is referenced in 1975. So the special permit allowed an additional activity, that is the sales. Um, and that's very clear from the pre-existence of the use in 69, uh, as well as the language that you see in 75 um, that refers to the convenience of the customers of the service station. So the service station has always existed. Um, I, I don't think anyone is questioning that. That's, that's not an issue uh, in terms of the service. So. You haven't heard that mentioned tonight, and, and that isn't part of the cease and desist order. And if you're going to make reference to this document before us um, as the pre-existing approval, then it obviously contains the terms before we, you've just. No, I'm going back. Yeah, there we go. Um, I'm not sure what the convenience of customers makes reference to. I think used cars will be displayed only in the rear of the stations. Pretty clear. Um, four sale signs, one sign no larger than 15 displayed on the station itself. I mean, I don't know that those are the issues before us. Um, if you want to make the issue of used cars only being displayed in the rear of the station, um, we can. Um, but no, no, that's not. No, I'm not. Um, I the 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 point as I go through is that the pre-existing service station, if they never got this special permit, uh, they would be able to have vehicles parked in the rear, on the side, in the front of the building. There was no limitations in any of the uh, approvals from the non-existing, pre-existing, non-conforming use. That's something that, you know, as, as you all know on, on the board, and certainly Attorney Needleman does as well, that subsequent regulations as they come into being um, can't stop you from doing what was pre-existing. Uh, and the service element, and that is having vehicles on site, there's never been any limitation on how many vehicles can be on site related to service. There are with respect to sales. So, one of the things I was uh, talking to Mike D'Amato about would be to be able to delineate that because in fairness to an enforcement officer, and I'll go through that with my client in a minute, um, you, it would be very, very difficult for an enforcement officer to be able to discern which vehicles are on the site because they're, they're there because my client uh, is repairing the vehicle as part of the service business uh, in which ones they plan to sell uh, under this as authorized by the special permit, because we'll, we'll admit that they cannot sell vehicles, uh, but for compliance with the requirements of, of the, the special permit that was originally granted uh, after the service station was in existence um, and has been you know, the subject of some enforcement because they think not, there, as time went by, there were uh, a need for displaying them in other locations, because as Attorney Needleman just mentioned, at this point in time, the only place they were allowed was at the rear of the station. So that's 1975. So now uh, we're gonna go forward in 675. This is the notice that they issued the decision with that limitation. You can only have the vehicles that you're selling in the back. And then in 1977, Mr. Evans was 
uh, the enforcement officer at that time noted to Mr. Evans that he, there were vehicles that were being displayed for sale in the front. Uh, and, and then the, uh, the, then later in 75, there's a, a determination um, that it was in compliance. Uh, and then here's another document in 75 he was permitted, and it refers back to the fact that he was permitted back in 72 initially to sell the vehicles. And here are minutes from the 75. There was one part I was gonna focus in on that I'm not, where the, the chairman of the commission uh, talked about the, the, the limitation of the meaning of the renewal, that it wasn't meant to, to allow for the termination. Uh, but I, I don't need to focus in on that. So I'll, I'll zip through, through these minutes, uh, but they did approve that. Um, now here in 78, they found that there was a violation that they were selling um, failure to comply with the restriction number two. And that was the location of where the vehicles were parked. Here's another instance in 78 where Mr. Evans, that they saw that there was a, a Ford Torino uh, that was parked uh, in the front window on display, whereas at that point in time, the only place that you could display vehicles for sale um, was in the rear. Uh, and again, another uh, an enforcement report from 79 on the observed there were vehicles that were parked to the west um, in violation of, of the standards. And so what that led to is the application uh, in 79 has been removed from the active file and become active if the buildings uh, for sale must be parked east of the building. Uh, and however, in the past, Mr. Evans' compliance has been somewhat sporadic. This location will bear further watching. It is my opinion, the further violation would, res would result in a cease and desist order. Again, that's with the location of vehicles for sale. Um, another one, here's an, now we fast forward to 87. And it says, you car used cars are being displayed forward of the front of the building. I believe their approval required that they be parked behind the building. And that's true. The park, the approval in 72 and 75 had it um, being in the back. Um, and then, so there was a cease and desist order in 87. Um, and then uh, that in 87, and then we fast forward to 89. And those are the conditions we've are already looked at. In 89, the conditions that were originally put in place regarding the sale of vehicles uh, was uh, modified. And so in 89, they, they, they gave the owner the ability to, to take advantage of, of the frontage for uh, the display of vehicles for sale. Um, and no, and there's no more than 14 could be uh, on display, six on the south, and eight on the north. Again, it actually reduced the size of the for sale stickers to, the, to an eight and a half by 11 size. Um, and then it said no more than 25 vehicles permitted on the site to be offered for sale. And so um, what I uh, have as part of this presentation is just a, a picture that uh, you, there's a used car dealer permit that's been granted. Uh, under state regulations, that kind of a, a permit uh, allows, is the kind of permit you'd have if you do both sale and repairs. There's a repairer only license uh, under the DMV regulations. Uh, and that would be the kind of permit they would have had in 1969 and 1970 and prior to 1969, because the Evans actually operated their business at the other location until the town took that location and then they moved their repair uh, and, and and um, fuel sales to, to this location. But this is the permit that you'd have if you wanted to repair vehicles. If my client decided they didn't wanna sell any more, they could still hold on to this license uh, and they could simply just repair vehicles. Um, this is a, uh, it, it's an indication, but you'll see a better picture of them. If, you, if you've gone to a used car and purchased a used car in Connecticut, or at least when I have, uh, there's a, a sticker like that in the window to indicate whether there's uh, an as uh, whether there's any kind of warranty uh, or whether it's being sold as is. Uh, and an example of that um, is is uh, in this photo. Um, you'll see an image 2012 is at the top, 
and then there's a, an image of the, of the buyer's guide. That's not a for sale sign. That is just something that the DMV requires. Um, so this is an example of a vehicle um, that is, uh, is on, on site. Um, can I simultaneously have uh, my client uh, to be able to identify himself for the record and answer some questions because some of these, I'm the attorney, but I, I need the, uh, my client to be able to answer some more detail regarding uh, operations on the site. Can we simultaneously speak if they come off mute? Not simultaneously speak, but we'll, we'll identify them <laughs> on the record. They, they need to identify their name and address for the record. So Billy, can you can you unmute and state your name and address for the record? Oh, uh, can everyone hear me? Yep. Oh yeah, first name Vasilios, last name Sacricus, uh, 56 Tunxis Ave, Bloomfield, Connecticut. Okay, Mr. Sacricus, um, the the image, can you see the image that I'm showing uh, now on the screen? Yeah, the black Audi, I can. All right, is that, did, did you take that photograph? I did. And is that uh, a vehicle that, well, first of all, what's your relationship to uh, the operator of the business? Uh, part, uh, part owner. And, and what's the name of the business on site? William Service Center. And is this a vehicle that is, uh, has been sold or is for sale uh, at Williams Service Center? Correct. It, it, is it for sale correct today? Currently, currently for sale, correct. All right. Um, and did your company place the sticker uh, 2012 uh, in the upper left corner of that vehicle? We did. All right. Uh, is that the kind of uh, signage that you put on vehicles to indicate when they are for sale on your property? Yes. All right. Um, and and can you explain uh, what the, the the white? I'll I'll go back. Up. Is this another image of that same vehicle, but close up it, to the? It is. It is. And that um, what is that document that says at the top buyer's guide? Uh, it's a it's a document that's required by federal law and state law to be displayed in all vehicles for sale um, that be across the country and the state of Connecticut. So it has to uh, explain if the vehicle comes with a warranty or if it doesn't, and if it does come with a warranty, what warranty coverage is stated. And, and how do you know that you're required to post that? I was actually told firsthand by a DMV state inspector. All right, I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Okay, can, can you see um, the a document dated February 25, 2022? Oh uh, yeah, I can see the top portion of the page. Okay, and I, I'll state for the record, this is the, uh, the same set of exhibits that the, the board has, uh, and they're also the ones that are posted on the webpage as being the app, uh, documents in support of the application. And I'm just gonna scroll through down till I get the photographs. Have you seen this image um, from the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals document package? I have. And does this depict uh, the, the uh, service station and uh, your used car dealership? Uh, it does. All right. Now, do you place the, the vehicle that we looked at, the Audi, that had the, the sticker on it? Do you place the sticker on vehicles that you are displaying for sale? Typically, yes. Expand on what you mean typically. 
Um, yeah, we, we usually put them on the car when they're out for, for sale, for display for sale. All right. Um, and on in this image, um, for example, um, this vehicle, and, and what I'm referring to is page 10 of 20 of all the ZBA documents, just for the purpose of the record. It's the first photograph that was, uh, according to the zoning enforcement officer's testimony, was taken by Mr. D'Amato. By the way, did Mr. D'Amato ask you uh, to identify which, uh, which, if any of these vehicles uh, were being offered for sale and which, if any of them were on site for your repair business? No, I, I've never spoken to Mr. D'Amato firsthand. Okay. Now, there's a to the to the right side of that photograph. There is a blue automobile. Are you familiar with that automobile? Uh, the Volkswagen in question. Yes. This one right now that I'm I'm putting my cursor on. Yep, it'd be a Volkswagen Jetta. Okay. And was that vehicle on site um, for the purposes of of your company sale? No. Why was it there? Repair. Um, how about the, what kind of vehicle is a white vehicle close to the building? That'd be a, a BMW one series. Right. And, and which, whose vehicle was that? That was uh, also in for repair. And you never sold that vehicle? Uh, in the past, but it was back for a, uh, a current repair. Approximately how long ago had you sold it, you know? Uh, three, four months. How about this uh, white vehicle that looks like a small truck but what is it uh it's an older nissan pickup truck late 80s uh that was also in for repair you weren't selling that vehicle no never have now there's a line of vehicles here um it looks like is that a dodge pickup truck yeah dodge ram 1500 all right was that for sale uh at the time yes have, have you since sold it uh yes and did that have a, can you see the, the entire um, windshield in this picture? No. Uh, you can't, but it, it would have had a sticker in the upper window like we normally place. Okay. Now I see the nose of another vehicle uh, mm -hmm. right there. It looks black. What, do you know what vehicle that is? Yeah, it's a Jeep Wrangler four-door. All right. Was that a vehicle that you were selling? No, that was in for repair. How about the next, looks like another, is that a pickup truck, the next one? Yep, that'd be a, a 2015 F-150. All right, and was that for sale? Uh, at the time it was, but it has since been sold. Okay, now again, you, you, you can't see the windshield, but would that have had uh, a, a tag on it that you with a year on it? Yes. And the next vehicle I see, what looks like a sedan that's black colored, is, is that right? Yeah, it'd be a BMW. Um, but that was not for sale. That was in for service for repair. And how about the, the, the red pickup truck? Uh, that was uh, displayed for sale. Now, it. I'll try to zoom in a, a little bit. Um, can you tell from that photograph whether or not there was a, a display in the window of that? Uh, it's hard to see from this angle of the picture, but I believe it of a sticker at that time. And would it have been in that location? It would have been. But it's hard to tell from that picture? Correct. All right. Um, how about the vehicle next to it? Um, that would have been for sale. It's hard to say what it was, but if you look at it closely, it looks like there is a year sticker in the upper corner of the windshield. Where I'm pointing right now? Correct, the yellow. And in the same, this was the red vehicle you looked at before? Also Correct. In yellow? Okay. Yep. All right, I'm gonna show you another photograph. This would be the next one in, in the, uh, the package from the, the zoning enforcement officer taken by the former acting zoning enforcement officer. Is this the sign in front of your building? It is. Okay. Do you know what it says? It's hard. I can't read it right now. I think it might have been other pages, but it's gonna say uh, Williams uh, Service Center. Uh, I believe it says Auto Sales and Service. All right. Okay. And 
this vehicle was that on display for sale? Was not. And um, when I'm talking about this vehicle, that would be page 11 of 20 of, of the materials in the package. And um, it's the, the picture in the forefront on the left. Um, what yeah. kind of vehicle is that? That'd be a BMW 3 Series. And why was that on site? For repair. And how about this vehicle? Uh, also, that was also on site for repair. And what kind of vehicle was that? That's a uh, Mercedes SL500. Okay. And did your company own, ever own either of those vehicles? Um, no. There's a pickup truck also uh, under, um, you know, it'd be behind the first vehicle I asked you about, black. Um, was that a vehicle on display for sale? Was not. And, and why was that there? For repair. And did your company ever own that vehicle? No. Uh, I see the back end of a blue vehicle, uh, blue looks like a blue sedan um, that's behind the second vehicle we talked about. Um, is yep. that a vehicle that you uh, were displaying for sale? Uh, it's hard to see because you can barely see the car, but I, uh, it looks like it might be a BMW, but uh, that car was not for uh, display for sale. On the right of this image, um, let's stay. Let's stay to the first row. I, we, you know, my first couple of questions were for the first two vehicles. Um, mm -hmm. there, there was a Mercedes you referenced. Behind the Mercedes, there is you can see a tire and a, a headlight and a, a, a white fender. Um, do you know what kind of vehicle that was? Uh, the Subaru Crosstrek. And was that on display for sale? Was not. And why was that on site? For repair as well. And now back behind it, I see another wheel and a red fender. Mm -hmm. um, is, is, you know what kind of vehicle that is? Yeah, it'd be a BMW 3 Series. Uh, and was that a vehicle you were displaying for sale? No, it was a vehicle we were working on to get ready for sale. Right. So you occasionally purchase cars that you repair, make them available, ready for sale? Correct. All right. And that was one of those? Correct. All right, and did it, there a point come in time where you repaired it and placed it on display for sale? Yes, that car has since been sold. The blue car behind it, uh, you see a, the rear of the car, was that being displayed for sale? Oh, uh, that was not. And uh, was that a vehicle your company owned? Uh, no, never have. And I guess one more in that. Um, I may have missed this. Actually, I think there's a couple. Um, I see a black vehicle um, close to the the, the uh, bay. How many bays do you have in that in your shop? Three bays. Right. And how many vehicles can be repaired at the same time? Um, three at the at simultaneously three. How many mechanics does he have? Three. So how are you working on all these cars at once? Uh, they continuously go in and out of the building. So we work on anywhere from 10 to 20 cars per day for people that are normal patrons and service customers. Thank you. Do you also take any vehicles in from any other dealerships to repair them for them? We do. And can you name some? Um, particular vehicles or particular dealerships? Dealerships that you work with that you, you'll uh, take in their yeah. vehicles to repair them. Yep, uh, there's East Windsor Auto uh, on Route 5 in East Windsor, Connecticut. Uh, there's M Sport Motor Works uh, located in Waterbury. Um, those are the two most common. All right, and this is, I see a vehicle near the bay. It's a black, black color vehicle. Um, do you know what vehicle that is? It's really hard to make out what it is. Okay. And um, on the, now I'll go all the way to the left side. Uh, I see there's a, uh, a silver, um, sedan, station wagon, hatchback type vehicle. Um, can you see that vehicle? I can, it looks like it's a silver Subaru Outback. And, and is that being displayed for sale? It is not. Is, it, is that a vehicle your company owned? No. And it was on site for repair? Correct. All right, I'll go down to the next set of pictures. Here's another one. Um, and this is for the, for the Take of the for the commission, it's twelve of twelve of twenty, um, and uh, I see a 
uh, a white um, vehicle. Is that the same vehicle that in the prior photograph you could just see a tire and a white fender that you identified? Exactly. All right. Um, and that you've already testified that's a vehicle that your company didn't own and wasn't on display? Correct. All right. And how about this red vehicle? Uh, that was the one that referenced in the prior picture that we were getting ready for sale that has since been sold. All right. And there's no license plate on the back of that, that vehicle, correct? That's correct. The, the white vehicle, on the other hand, there is a, a Connecticut license plate on it? Yep. All right. Now, there's a black, black vehicle uh, here. Is that one that, you, that, can you identify that now? Yeah, that's a, uh, the near the a Honda Fit. Yeah, it's a Honda Fit. All right. Was that a vehicle your company owned? No. Uh, it was there for repair? Correct. How about uh, the vehicle to the right of it? Uh, that was also a service customer. Um, they deemed it not worthy of fixing, so it was parked there waiting for the tow truck to come take it to bring it to the junkyard. And I'll go to the to the far right of this photograph. It looks it looks like an Audi symbol. Is that a is that a black or a dark Audi? Yeah, it's a black Audi S5. And were you displaying that for sale? We were. Right. That car is. Oh. Did it have a sticker on the window? Um, I can't see in the picture, but I believe it did. And how about this white car next to it? Uh, it looks like a white three series. And are you familiar with that car? Was it on display for sale? Was not displayed for sale. It looks like one of the wholesale vehicles may have worked on for another dealership. And how could you tell it looks like that? Because uh, it wasn't one of my vehicles. There's no plate on it. So I'm assuming it was another dealership's vehicle we were working on. And how about the silver car next to it? Uh, that was a customer vehicle. It's a Buick. I see three pickup trucks, or at least I think that's what they are, um, that are all uh, parked um, in behind the vehicles you've already identified. Were any of those vehicles on display for sale? No, all three of those are customer vehicles. Excuse me, I, I just had a question of, of either um, Attorney Needleman or Linda. Back at, at the beginning of the presentation, you were talking about outside storage of vehicles and was there a limit on that somewhere that you had mentioned? I believe over, you're, overnight storage. Yes, so you're making reference to section 6.11 in section 4.1 D4JJ. Um, so far, um, neither council nor the owners have addressed those issues yet. And that is part of the uh, violations that have been noted for you. And what was the total vehicles? They're, they're actually looking at the uh, Verbiage, there is no number. It says that uh, service repair or storage of motor vehicles may be permitted as long as the overnight storage of all motor vehicles takes place within the confines of a building. Okay, so so we're not we're not disputing that some of those cars and those pictures are for repair. Is that is that correct? Oh. Right, we have never, we've never disputed okay. that. Now that um, we spent all that time on that, but so aren't these all supposed to be stored inside then during overnight then? Well, that's what the regulation states. Okay, so maybe, maybe you can, uh, maybe Mr. Slater can address that because we're not disputing that they have cars that they are repairing. And but I, I, there's no way he can fit all those cars in that building at night. He's not required to if it existed as a non-conforming use. You wouldn't ever be able to put a small repair or business at this location today. No one um, 
Uh, I don't think anyone in this board has ever seen anyone operate a, a small car repair business and have, have built a warehouse to put all the vehicles into it. So today, um, but let me, I'll, I'll share my screen on that one. Um, and what you'll see is if the primary use in the building is, um, and let me just show you that section of the regulations and zoom in on that. So 6.11, um, the critical words there are outside storage of registered vehicles, excluding dealer or repair plate registrations, not related to uses in permanent buildings on a site. That's the critical language. The use, if you have an existing use, which in this case is a repair building, this is permitted for two reasons. One, it's a pre-existing use from 1969 um, and uh, before there even uh, the zone even existed. Uh, and it would be, even if it were subject to this regulation, if it was a permitted repairer's building, the outside storage is related to a use in the building. That is a repair business. Uh, and that is quite common. Now, frankly, I don't think if this were raw land today um, and someone was proposing to put a, uh, a, a used car uh, repair business at this location, you might not authorize it. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter is, is it existed um, per the 1969 um, approval and, and you saw the map of the, of the existing uh, facility in 1970. So uh, there is no requirement that if your primary use requires the storage of those vehicles, uh, that these sections would apply, even if it applied to these folks and it does not apply to these folks because they're a pre-existing non-conforming use. Um, and I would go back as far. I looked at aerial photographs um, and there's a, a, there's a, a gap um, in them uh, that... Um, Tony Slater. Is, yes. Tony Slater, before you go back, can you go back to the other sure. slide there? Sure, hold on one moment. Okay, so what about the buffer and screening? Doesn't that apply to the, to the site also? No, that's following the colon. Um, and first of all, if it's a non-conforming business that existed, uh, then no. If you adopt the regulations, you, you, could, you could say, today, you could say nobody can sell, nobody can have a repairer's business in the town of Bloomfield. You could do that today. Your regulations could turn it into a prohibited use. All the existing repair businesses could continue as the, the as they did prior to the adoption of, of the zoning regulations. But doesn't the buffer and screening paragraph relate to the the vehicles that are on site regardless? Uh -huh. No, um, it says outside stores excluding um, dealer registration and not related to uses in permanent buildings on a site may be permitted under the following conditions. So it's only those vehicles that 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 are not related to the permanent, um, the outside storage registered vehicles outside. It, you couldn't operate this kind of business. You could not have a three bay garage and operate it um, and, and without being able to have vehicles on site. And these, and that's if you were to establish it, but these regulations were not in well, place in 1960. Well, that being said, you know, under dealers and repairs, they allow six, vehicles well they used to allow six vehicles for sale so if you got a dealers and repair on a property you were allowed to sell six vehicles and you have six for uh, display so this site you know you say it couldn't be done but if it was a repair facility even if everything was inside the state would allow them to have six cars for sale but the zoning would require buffing a buffer of some kind. Isn't that true? No, not a, not for a pre-existing use. If you established a, a pre-existing use, this actually prohibits uh, the outside storage all altogether, um, unless you have a number of criteria, but it has an ex exception um, for those, if it's not outside storage of registered vehicles, not related to uses in permanent buildings, may be permitted, permitted as following. 
So these are vehicles related to the use in a permanent building. The building is a car repair shop. That's why those vehicles are there. They're not there for any other purpose. Uh, and so, so not only does the language accept it, but the language doesn't apply because there was a pre-existing non-conforming use. Yeah, but, but didn't, didn't somebody along this process agree to these regulations? On the sure, the Zoning Commission. Yeah, the zoning, like I say, the Zoning Commission next month could adopt a regulation that says there shall be no- No, 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 no. no. The, no. the chain, the chain of regulations going back to Don Evans. Didn't mm -hmm. somebody along the way say, okay, you let us have the cars and we'll only keep so many up here and the rest we'll keep in the back? No, only related to the sales. If you look at every single document, there's a limitation regarding sales. They limited when, where you, the original one said they have to be in the back. Um, and so, and we will allow you to the back. In 1989, they expanded it to allow the, the number of vehicles for display for sales. You will not see a, the zoning enforcement officer hasn't submitted a single document and there isn't one in the, in the file that limits the vehicles that can be on the site related to being repaired. It just, it just simply does not exist. So, that was so, a what use saying, that did. Mm -hmm. so what you're saying is your client's vehicles, all the, say, let's use number 30, that most of these vehicles were being repaired, repaired and they didn't, uh, they didn't have license plates or stickers. Is that your argument? It's not my argument, it's a fact. Uh, the most of the vehicles that are on the site are there for, are there for repair. Okay. And did, did the zoning enforcement officer ever walk through the property the prior Mr. zoning and check the vehicles for registration? Mr. Uh, my client indicated that Mr. D'Amato never spoke to him. How about uh, Mike, the previous uh, one? None, none of the zoning enforcement officers? Well, no, that's so Mr. I was referring to Mr. D'Amato. Mr. Mr. D'Amato took those photographs that are the site of this and he did not speak to them about which ones were for sale and which were for. Um, well, there, there were previous uh, place cease and desist orders. I think Mr. Casella had one mm -hmm. also. Um, there's one that was dated for 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, right, and, and I expect, and there was a $2,000 penalty uh, that was paid, as, as Attorney Needleman said. So there must have been a violation in terms of the, the, uh, the, the number of vehicles of where they were stored or, or how many vehicles were on site, more than 25 for sale, or they were putting too many in either the north or the south location. So um, I, the, the court file doesn't speak to exactly where there were or how many there were. I can only infer that there must have been a violation of the special permit and the special permit limits the number of vehicles that are allowed for sale. And your client is saying that every uh, every vehicle that is for sale has a, a yellow sticker on the window. That's correct. He, he, he said that, that that there might be an instance in which, and he can elaborate on that. But uh, but that is the that is the intent. In fact, that's what I wanted to start working with Mike Tomato on was to make it easier because and and I've talked to them and they've actually already implemented. Uh, some of that, um, but I was going to work with Mike in terms of and, and, and in terms and, and of how come, how come nobody how come how come that wasn't done? That was that was the whole purpose of us giving you a continuance for from March seventh to tonight, and we expected that by tonight we'd be able to get a report that you guys had worked together and that they were working towards compliance. And it did happen. Mike and I had we've had we had two conversations about that, and then the most the more most recent of them, um, he wanted more information. He he believed that the dealer that the, the the DMV permit that they had only permitted the sale and not the repair. And I told him I didn't believe that was true, and I was going to research it. And then in turn, I asked him because I wanted to have come up with a drawing to show the areas. Um, specifically where the vehicles were and would have my client not commingle uh, as we went through those photographs. There were a couple of instances where there were two or three cars that were uh, on display for sale, and then there was one that was not. So I wanted to do that. So, so Mike and I, that's why I, I, I told you when I started my presentation, I'm, I was shocked that I'm here now 
uh, because Mike and I hadn't completed that. We still had, we have, you know, 65 days of extensions that we can grant. So my expectation is, you know, I've been, I got an email from him, sorry, I didn't get back to you. I'm not going to be involved in the hearing on Monday. And that's what I saw on Friday when I was at the airport. And because my expectation, because we hadn't connected back after two conversations, he was busy and that we were going to do exactly what we did last time. Um, and that it would just, we, I would grant you another continuance and he and I would continue uh, on those efforts. And I just got the message. And that's when I spoke to Attorney Needleman about getting a, an extension in order to be able to work with the current enforcement officer to that same effect. Uh, and he indicated he wasn't in favor of the last extension and that um, and that he couldn't you know, be assured that I would get one tonight. So I couldn't put my clients in jeopardy and show, you know, even though I was at parents weekend and wait until tonight and ask you for more time, only they have you saying no. So I, they, we were engaging in good faith efforts to do exactly that, to try to make it easier for, for the zoning enforcement officer uh, to be able to discern between the two kinds of vehicles. Okay. And, I, and I'll show you the, the, the other section of the regulation. Um, and I call, would you, um, these are very similar to form-based regulations that um, the town of Canton is one of the towns I represent. So they're very modern uh, style regulations. Uh, and I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna go to the other section of the regulations that was, that was referenced. Um, Okay, so the other, the section 4D that was referenced in, in the enforcement order um, is also a, that's a regulation. Now, you know, this is a zone, the Bloomfield Center District, BCD. Um, these are very modern regulations. Um, these are not, same regulations in place in 1969. And now if someone wished to come in and wanted to establish a repair business, uh, one thing that section uh, four, and I'm gonna go down to, I believe it's G, either II or JJ, uh, JJ. Um, and right now, if you were to do this, um, and this was, it's got a date beside it, which is 3-28-13. Um, it says that service repair or storage may be permitted as long as the overnight storage of all vehicles takes place within the confines of the building. That's exactly what I, I'm talking about. And that zone today, the way the Planning and Zoning Commission would like to see that area developed for raw land or if you know, there were you know, somebody else wished to uh, do a repair business, you've got to create a business, a building big enough uh, that everything could be inside and maybe a specialty, you know, sports car place could justify this, this constructing a business building large enough to bring the building in. But that's as of 2013, this goes back to 1969 uh, and Connecticut General Statutes 8-2 protects any non-conforming use. You can't adopt the regulation after the fact and tell somebody, it's now you're in violation because you're, you're now you have, you know, overnight, um, you have building uh, vehicles that are not within the confines of the building. This 2013 regulation simply does not apply to a 1969 service center. So, so that they, you know, I, I, again, was hoping to work with the enforcement officer to find a way um, that to clarify some of the misunderstanding and some aspects of, of the, the findings um, and also to try to make it easier going forward for an enforcement officer to be able to identify um, the areas where the vehicles are for sale and that they're not commingled, um, which is something uh, that you know, I would still hope I, I can I could work on with the enforcement officer, but I'm now you know was put in a position to be able to, to, to proceed uh, tonight. I mean, when you look at those photos, I mean, that's an eyesore very close to the center of town. So um, I think, you know, all of us would like to resolve this issue and we'd like to see, we'd like to see um, them clean up that site. 
question. I'm sorry, Linda. Sorry, I, I have a question. Oh, okay, uh, go ahead. I know when they receive uh, the license through the state of Connecticut, a site plan is required. How many vehicles were they approved through the state of Connecticut to be on site? I don't know. I just got permission. I just got the uh, uh, the, and, and I'm not sure that the, the that the that they do a, a count for that, but they might. But that's something I could look at when I spoke to Mike. Yeah. Mike and I taught uh, Mr. D'Amato, the, the former acting zoning for, uh, enforcement officer. Um, he was questioning whether or not they, there could be any repair unrelated to a sale, and I thought that um, that there could. And so that's what I, I was working on sort of for my portion of the homework. And just for the sake of the record, um, it's uh, the, uh, the, the regulations are 14-5, uh, 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 I'm sorry, the statute is 14-51, um, subpart A1 to 2, has to do with uh, the type of permit uh, that would allow for the sale and repair of motor vehicles and then the local regulations, or sorry, the, the DMV regulation is 14-63-11. So if you just have a repairer's license, you can't sell. But if you have a dealer's license, uh, then you can sell and you, you can repair. And I'd be happy to look into that. Um, and I'd also be happy to work with the enforcement officer in, in terms of um, you know, coming up with a plan that would delineate the way vehicles are, are displayed in, in front of the property. Used car and repair dealer with the state of Connecticut. Yes, it's it's used cars um, along mm -hmm. with the repair. Um, Madam Chair. Yes, um, Mark. We've been going, Mark Needleman. Um, we've been going close to two hours now, mm -hmm. and I've heard council uh, indicate on several occasions that um, it hoped to have additional time to work with staff to get this resolved. Um, and has questioned how many of the vehicles on the site are for sale as opposed to uh, being there for repair purposes. Um, I have a suggestion which you and perhaps Attorney Slater uh, would agree to when I say you, the commission, um, and that would be to continue this hearing um, and arrange for an immediate inspection of the property um, between staff and the owner uh, to go through it. Um, if council wishes to be there, certainly, you know, uh, that's not a problem. Um, to determine exactly what vehicles are present for sale, which vehicles are there for repair, which areas are referenced in the permit as being north side, south side, front of, and the rear, um, consistent with what council indicated in terms of uh, the desirability of delineating those areas with particularity uh, to avoid future uh, issues with respect to placement of for sale vehicles. Um, I mean, we've heard enough here tonight, in my opinion, but it's the opinion of the commission to realize that there, there is some confusion here. Uh, clearly, councils indicated that there are pre existing approvals that come into play. And generally speaking, I would agree that those principles do come into play. Um, but again, it's a question of facts, and I'm not sure we all have enough facts to make an informed decision at this point. And if the commission were interested, I think it could ask attorney Slater whether or not uh, his clients would agree uh, to continuing this matter until your next meeting um, subject to uh, there being a, uh, an immediate, when I say immediate in the next couple of days, um, meeting between the owner, their reps and the town and its reps uh, on the site uh, to once and for all uh, uh, at least determine which areas we're dealing with and what vehicles are deemed to be uh, under repair or present for repair, uh, as opposed to those that are either for sale or in the process of being sold. 
And that, that is agreeable to us. In fact, I wanted to go one step further because I really appreciated when I, I spoke to uh, Mr. D'Amato and, and have the same perspective from uh, Ms. Loriano is I'd like to come up with a plan so that, as I say, that there would be better delineation on the site uh, so that when a zoning enforcement officer looks, they'd be able to see those are the ones that are for sale. And, and we appreciate what the board is saying in terms of uh, you know, more attractive. I mean, the reality of a, of a uh, used, used uh, repair place, it's not going, you know, it, it's not this is going to be as attractive as something that you might approve today. But I think we can we can do that. I would agree with that, that continuance to accomplish that. Um, definitely have an inspection this week. I hate to commit to the next two days because I, I haven't looked at my calendar, but we would try to do it within the next two days, but certainly this week. Mark, can we... Uh... Can we can we put a limit on that of, of five days or seven days? We you you could indicate that it's the expectation of the board that it take place with the next number of days, and okay. and if it doesn't, um, then obviously you can take that into consideration um, in your future decision making. Okay, all right. Um, what does the rest of the board feel? Um, I, I think that's reasonable. I, I don't know if Linda wanted to add something to that. I see she was trying to get something in there, but well, you know, it's going to be continued. I, I believe we can we can speak and, and talk to the attorney. I just wanted to state that I understand that there is uh, no number on the car repair uh, or there's no indication in any of the records that we have or that we've seen so far that indicates the amount of repair uh, vehicles mixed in with the sale, but it doesn't mean that it was permitted as well. Um, it doesn't mean that you know you were allowed to have additional 40 vehicles on the property because it doesn't really indicate it here. Um, so it, it doesn't just grant them the right to have an X amount of number of vehicles. That's all I meant. Like there's an area where it's just not clear. Um, but anyway, we can definitely work together. Um, I hope to hear from him soon and coming up with a solution. Um, again, uh, by the look of it and, and dealing with other uh, approval of locations and used car dealer and repair shop in the past, I do know that there is a limit um, and there are requirements even through the state of Connecticut, which is not you know, with us, but we can definitely work together with the applicant to make them understand that and to come with a solution where, um, you know, we can uh, comply in, in some ways, um, you know, with, with our, uh, with the regulations and um, determine the, the amount of vehicles that are for sale. Uh, it's, it's just undetermined at this time. And I, I agree that we should continue this work with the applicant and hopefully come before you uh, with with a better plan. Um, okay, thank, and, thank you. And Madam Chair, Mark Needleman again. Um, I think a couple of the issues that need to be addressed as the parties work um, would be uh, state regulations concerning uh, the number of vehicles that can be placed, um, any site plan requirements, which have not been uh, addressed by anyone so far, and I think they should be to the extent they're applicable, uh, whether they be under the town's regulations or the state's regulations. I'd also remind everyone that there was some signage uh, provisions limiting one eight and a half by 11. Uh, presumably that would be the warranty sticker um, but we've also seen there are additional stickers on the car, which would go beyond the terms. So that should be also discussed. So I think those matters are something the commission is going to want to hear about at its next meeting. And just on that last point, we do not believe, and we'll talk to the zoning enforcement officer, we do not believe the DMV required warranty sticker is a for sale sticker, that the for sale sticker is the, is the year sticker that's placed on that. Um, and, and so that we, we can discuss that with the enforcement officer. And she was very kind to call me today and thank you for doing that. And, uh, and we'll I'll call you tomorrow. We'll work on getting it scheduled. So it, it, it sounds like there's consensus from the, from the board, but I won't speak for the board, but if they do, so, we'll hear from you tomorrow. Okay, so um, the board, um, 
Does somebody, does everybody agree that we should continue it? And I was thinking five business days, unless somebody is thinking something different. No, I agree that we can continue it and I'm, I'm agreeable to that. Um, I was thinking more like seven business, seven days. Well, um, I was thinking five business would be seven. Seven, right. Okay. Um, the only question, the only question I have is: Is there a time limit for a public hearing to be closed? 30, 35 days uh, in order without our without an extension, and we have an additional thirty five or thirty plus days because um, we we you had an extension. I don't even know if you needed time to extend to today. You might not have needed any extra days because you need sixty five days to start the hearing. Once the hearing opens, you have 35 days to close it. And we have a, a total of 65 days to give you extension. So what I was understanding the chair was going for is how quickly we had to meet with the zoning enforcement officer. Correct. My expectation was you were going to continue this hearing to the next meeting. Right, which would be okay. May 2nd, not May okay. 1st. Okay. And, and uh, that extension, Attorney Slater, is, is one that also your client agrees to grant the town. Is that correct? Well, yes, is it, but the public hearing started tonight, so we don't even, we're, we're in agreement to continue it. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you just don't even need to give you any days to do it. Okay. Madam so so my Mark, suggestion was just that they, they meet with the zoning enforcement officer within the next five business days. And that is acceptable to the applicant. Okay. So uh, do I have somebody that wants to make a motion to continue the hearing? I'll make a motion to continue a hearing encompassing everything that was agreed here. <laughs> I, I, I second, second that motion. Wait, wait, wait. Who seconded it? Okay. Shirley, I heard. Jennifer. All right. Um, and all in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Good night, everyone, and thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, all. So it was. Did everybody agree to that? No, yeah. it was unanimous. Okay, just want to make sure. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you. And that was certain, and that was five business days to me. Right. Ma Madam Chair, I'm just not sure there was a formal vote, and the vote was announced. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. It was there was a mm -hmm. vote. It, the motion was made. It was seconded, and the vote was five unanimous. people. Yeah in favor of it. Thank and you. Zero against it. Thank you. Are we clear that um, the 11th is the fifth day, right? Correct. OK. Thank you for clarifying. OK, so the second is the application of Paul Benny. Uh, he's here. Let me just put it along. She's still yep. with us. <laughs> well, yeah. here, here. I'm sorry. I'm here. I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can. So, Paul, can you state your name and address for the record, and then tell us uh, what you are, uh, what you'd like to do, or what you need here? Yes. Thank you. My name is Paul Benny. I live at 112 Terrafield Road. And that's in Bloomfield. That's the section of road on the Simsbury side of the road after it got closed off. And you may remember me from last month. I came and asked to move my property line over um, uh, 40 feet from uh, 108 Terrafield Road, which I also own that property up here. And um, I didn't realize when I was asking to put a new garage up here that there was a height restriction for a detached garage. Um, I had submitted some ske a sketch and some other things to Linda. I don't know if anybody's able to see that. I'm just on my iPhone, so I, I, I can't present it. Um, but but basically, I was just looking to- I can Sorry, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, Paul Benny, Linda Loriano. Hi, Hi, Linda. Hi. Uh, I, I, I can share it. If, if, the commission, if the board would like me to share it, I know it was sent last minute. Um, so uh, the, the board members uh, do you know, because I can't get to that and do okay. this at the same time. So would you like me to share it? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So
So I'm going to share it, uh, Mr. Benny, and you can proceed to speak when it's up on the screen. One moment. <clears throat> Uh, I think oh, thanks, Linda. If you just go to the next page down, um, I'm not a new resident of Bloomfield. I've lived on this property since 1986. I acquired the property at 108 Terrafil Road, I think in about, I can't remember exactly when, but it was about 2007. I bought it from Jack Yerkes. Um, I'm planning on retiring up here. The garage, I bought the house when the driveway came right down into the garage and it had already been undermined when I bought the property. My intention was to correct the water problem up here, which I have to a certain extent, except for getting a new garage in. And, and I wanted to build it up about eight to 12 inches so that I have a natural swale for the water coming down to push it to the right of that picture down into the stream. If you're familiar with the property, you know, most people up know that I've put a lot of money into trying to take care of the water. <laughs> I've put trap rock drains all around the house. I even put a I even put a street drain, a six inch street drain up here to get the water at the top of my driveway. Um, the garage here was put in around 1950. That was before the second floor had been put on the house. Um, from what I understand, I, again, I didn't move in until 1986. Um, all I'm really looking to do is um, put a new garage and I wanted to match the style of the house. Linda, if you, I think one or two pages in, I sort of put a picture of the house and sort of my view of wanted to, what I wanted to put. I, I really um, wanted to try and match the style of the Dutch colonial house. And that would mean that it would, you know, with raising nothing's level here everything you know i'm on the terrafil gorge so it's a very very steep property um and what i was hoping to do was um be able to just put a detached garage that matches the house i was going to match the siding i was going to match the roof and um i know that there's a height restriction but coming from an engineer i'm an engineer myself i've been an aerospace engineer over utc or raytheon now for 37 years the roof line of trying to join that to the house it just would it wouldn't make sense from an engineering or a maintenance or an architectural standpoint and the shared wall would be right where all my kitchen appliances are it's a very unique property and so i was just hoping that um, I could convince everybody to allow me to put a garage, sort of raise the foundation a little bit just so I have a natural swell. I don't want to put it any further back because I'm up against my leach field on the back and then a very steep hill after that. And there are town records. I did put this whole sept engineered septic system in myself or not myself through, you know, I had it put in by a contractor in 1987 when I bought the property or one year after I bought the property. Um, and um, so I was looking for this hardship to be able to just put this garage in that matches the house. Um, and, um, you know, none of this, um, the existing house, if you go a little further, I think I measured it this morning at 23 feet. I would keep the garage below that. That drawing I drew to the right, I just didn't have a 3D CAD system to draw it home on. Um, um, it, it would be, I would keep the roof line below the existing house or I'd like to match it, but at least I would keep it a little bit below if that would be um, the requirement. I'm sort of looking for permission tonight to at least get some architectural drawings done for the property so that I can get a garage. And I just think the existing ranch style garage, it just looks terrible against the Dutch colonial house. And um, I'm not looking to put an apartment. I would have an upstairs to the garage. The only thing I would be using it for is I have a small recording studio in my basement. It's been down there for 35 years and I'm looking to move it above the garage just so I can give the laundry room to um you know to the basement and that's sort of my pitch for the garage um nobody would see it up here i own all the property up here my neighbor's fine with it at 108 terrafell um and the only really you would never see it until you drive up to my property anyways so um that's sort of my pitch are there are there any questions about so, it or so you're you're um asking for how many feet up to 23 <laughs> 
Well, I, I think it would look best. Uh, the, the side Dutch colonials are 20 feet, at least on the side that I'm showing here that I took the picture. The garage is 20 by 20 now. I'm hoping to, I wanted to go 24, but if I'm really restricted by the height to keep the same natural architectural roof line, I could probably go 22 wide by maybe 24 deep, moving the front of the garage a little bit forward. Um, what I was hoping to do is get some, and I would have, you know, as an engineer myself, I would have some structural plans put, you know, in place. I'm on a very steep hill up here. Um, there is, they, it looks like they filled the existing garage with sand. I would also be looking to dig a little of that out and probably put a little more hard pack in there as I fill it up maybe eight inches just to get a natural, you know, push to the right to get the water away from the house. It's very difficult for me to travel right now um, at certain times of the year when there's a lot of water. I need to be here um, just in case that drain in front of the garage clogs and, and, and it can be a real issue. The leach field is right behind the garage. So the total height is, is what is the total height you're proposing? It doesn't really say it here. It just says to exceed oh, 15 yeah. feet in height. I want a, I want a total. Sure. Well, looking at the picture that we're looking at now, the peak of the house from the door, let's say, because everything's on a hill here, is 23 feet. I would not exceed that. I would like to come close to matching it, but I would be a little bit below because as you can see, the house has been lifted up a little bit on that side. So I would be less than the existing height, at least on the what we would say is the south side of the house. Anybody on the board have questions? Alan. Yeah. Um, I really have no problem with, you know, extending the height <clears throat> unless uh, Linda does. But on a side note, uh, you really need to talk to a wetlands agent in town before you spend a lot of money on this project. I, I absolutely agree with you. And I did grab a permit and I will, I, I, I think it's, is it Mr. Castillo, is it? Or yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yep. he, he knows me well because when I first moved into the property and they did the two turnarounds up here, we filled in my backyard with about 600 yards of fill and yeah. um, I've, I've managed to hold it. So he knows me well. Yeah. Um, okay. And, I, um, I mean, I'm, I'm just telling you that, you know, because I'm concerned that you're going to spend a lot of money and run into some issues. Right. But I, I'm not saying that, but you know, you need to do that. But I really have no problem with the height limit there. I appreciate okay. that. Thank you. Anybody else have any any comments or or have any questions of the applicant? I I don't have any questions. I just um, I'm like Alan. I don't have any problems with the height of it. It looks like it's um, it's been mapped out pretty well. So I, I don't have any issues with it at all. Okay. That if it's okay, I will pursue, I, I totally agree with the wetlands issue. I know there's a stream there um, and I want to engineer this right. I certainly, I mean, I'm an aerospace engineer. I work, I've worked on jet engines for 37 years now. Right. Um, I want to map this out, right. Make sure that we hold it in here properly. So it doesn't slip off the hill. So <laughs> if, if it's okay, I'll, I'll get a hold of Mr. Castillo and, and work the wetlands issue too, at the same time. And I guess what I'm wondering is that, and I don't know if I'd get it in this year, but I'm looking to use a place like the barnyard where I can really get some structural drawings done and architectural drawings. Is that, would I get permission to do that now while I work with the wetlands or, or should I wait on, on giving a deposit to a company like that? If you have to go into wetlands, then you're gonna to have to get approval from wetlands once you get approval, you know, from us so yeah. do that first then do that yeah. first then okay i mean you're 18 feet from the stream and the regulated area is right. i don't know what kind of stream it gives 100 to 200 it's 100 feet. isn't it yeah <laughs> so you're within a regulated area i would talk to peter first before you start spending money on plans i would no. get his sign off because he might decide that you need to yeah. go to the wetlands commission as well but that would be, you know, between you and him once once we're done tonight. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, I just want to make sure there, um, Linda, there's nobody in the audience for this application, correct? Uh, that's correct, Linda Loriano, zoning enforcement officer. Yes, uh, that is correct. Uh, no opposition uh, or, or no comments um, regarding this proposal. It was posted and noticed. Um, and I just, uh, you know, with my, my only, uh, you know, suggestion would be that uh, he actually gives gives us accurate measurements to ensure that um, it won't exceed. Um, secondly, that the structure wouldn't be, the footprint is not bigger than the house. Um, and uh, just to ensure, I know he wants to kind of move it up and I don't know if that's gonna increase the height or, um, I, you know, so th there are still some, some things we'd like to see how far from the house it's gonna be. It looks like it's pushed up, those renderings look like he pushes it more towards the front. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure yet. As and the wetlands back. is in the back though, correct? Well, there, yes, it's still gonna be, so he wanted to still remain within the same footprint of, of what is there now. He is, um, you know, uh, it, it looks like it's wider. Uh, the proposal is a little bit wider than what is there now. Um, I don't know if that's gonna pose any challenges with wetlands, but yes, I would definitely check with our wetlands agent to ensure that that structure and what he's proposing uh, foundation and everything would 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 be good with our, you know, the wetlands commission. Um, and, and it's gonna be structurally sound for the site. The reason for the second level is because uh, Mr. Benny uh, uh, did um, indicate or his original plan was to kind of expand on this house towards the back, but that's not possible. There was uh, some sort of septic underground there. Um, and it, quite frankly, it's it would have been more of a challenge to kind of expand out. And so he he wanted to, you know, uh, add to the property. Um, and, and the only way to do that was to have a second story onto his garage. Um, and so we that that was what was indicated to, to our office. Um, is there a similar oh. you're talking about doing in New York at the time? A Dutch colonial? Yeah. With a different I'm sorry, I'm not sure who's speaking on it, the record. It's, it's uh, Sean, right? Um, Seth? Seth? I mean, Seth. That was Seth speaking. But I didn't, I didn't hear you. Can you say it again, Seth? Yeah. Seth, you're muted. Yeah, no, I'm okay. I'm good. You're good? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Seth. Anybody else? I'd just oh, like to you? ask an, a, a question about the second story. Um, Mr. Benny indicated that he wanted to build a second story, but what was it supposed to be used for? Well, he can answer. Um, He's still there. Okay. Sure, I'm sorry. It, currently in my basement, I, I've, I've been a musician for since I was a kid for almost, you know, 55 years now. I have a recording studio in my basement, and there's a couple of us that write music up here. I have been for 35 years, and I'm going to put it up there. And I was also a Taekwondo student of uh, Master Youth Academy in Bloomfield, actually. I've been doing martial arts for almost my whole life, and I'm going to put a few of my exercise equipment up there, too, above my garage. I'm not going to bring water or anything like that. It's not for an apartment or anything like that. Okay. That's what I was wondering, whether or not it would be rented out to someone to no, live. No, not at all. Okay. No. All right. So it won't have any plumbing or up there, correct? Is that no, just mean? electricity. I don't, I don't want any plumbing up there. No, it would okay. be too complicated. I don't want a bathroom or anything like that. No. Okay. Um, all right. Is everybody all set? If with uh, questions for Mr. Benny. If so, I can close the public hearing. Yep. Okay. And do I have somebody that would like to make a motion? We probably do want to put that, you know, a height restriction or at yeah, least, yeah. you know, not to exceed. Um, does anybody want to take that? Do you, you want to make a motion to close the public hearing? No, or I don't. I just. Okay. There's no, no, I just, I stayed it. <laughs> okay. And that's it. It's closed. <laughs> oh, it's closed. Okay. Oh, well, why? I, Did you have something you needed to say? No, no. I just didn't know the formality. Well, 
I'll, I'll Mike, make a motion. Uh, uh, oh, wait, L Linda does want to say uh, something. Yeah, sorry, I, I just, I, right, as the, you know, new zoning enforcement officer here, I just like to make sure that, you know, um, uh, we don't run into issues later on where um, there is no um, measurement that would be like a certified measurement. I, I don't want this. So the maximum height permitted, I just want to really make this clear for an accessory structure, including garages is 15 feet in height. And that's, uh, you know, at the peak center of, of, of the roof. Um, and uh, he's asking for an entire full second floor. Um, I understand that he wants to raise the the uh, the foundation um, or the footings in order to to have the structure, and I want to make sure that it's not going to exceed. If if you grant uh, an exception or a, a variance tonight for a certain amount of feet, we really don't have uh, a set number right now, as the um, you know the, the drawings don't really have those kind of architectural. Uh, numbers and and that would be my only concern. So if you're granting, you're granting something that's going to be above 15 feet. To what height? Do we really know that that's exactly 20? You know, the peak of of this roof at center here is is 15 feet. Um, I I mean 23 feet as indicated on the plans. I I understand he's a you know professional engineer uh, by by trade, um, but I I don't know if if that. You know, I would just be cautious first on um, the number of, of feet that you would be allowing uh, an increase on due to the elevation of that. Would you be happier if we said not to exceed the height of the house? Well, at, at the at the center, at the peak of the roof center, yes, because if you say not to exceed, that means what if you know the, the rooftop goes a little bit higher? But that yes, at so you you would prefer it to be that way, instead of saying twenty three feet, you'd prefer that the motion be made that not to exceed the yep. the height of the house of, of the peak of the roof at center. Yes, okay. meaning peak that yeah, because it's always a little bit less when when you you know you look at the uh, you know you look at the pitch. <laughs> so. Um, they do measure it to the pitch of the top. So we, we just want to make sure that um, it's it's always a little a little bit less, but yeah. Okay, and somebody, were you going to make that motion, Alan? Yeah, I moved okay. that move the okay. uh, application for Paul Benny for a variance uh, request uh, from section 37, 3.7B of the Bloomfield Zoning Regulations to allow proposed detached garage to ex not to exceed um, 23 feet or the peak of the existing house. And that's from the ground, not from the foundation. Okay, and I, I guess it's also subject to wetlands, but we, I, I don't think we need that's, to- add That's a different that. story. That's yeah. a different story. So, okay. Um, this is Jennifer, and I second that motion. I, I'm trying to think. I think, all right. OK. And all in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? Abstentions? No. OK. So the motion's granted. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will. I won't do anything until I talk with Mr. Castaldi and I won't do anything until I talk with Linda again, but I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Is thank it okay you. if I sign off? I can sign off, right? Yeah. Yep. Bye. Okay. Thank yes. you very much. Thank Good you. night. Well, we Good kick night. you off. <laughs> Alan. <laughs> okay. Uh, we still have one more here. Yeah. Okay, application of Global Tech Design, LLC. Who is here for that application? Oh, let me let him in, I apologize. Mr. Mark Mullins. 
Okay, so Mr. Uh, Mullins, um, this is Chairman Isaacson. Can you state your name and address for the record and tell us uh, what you're proposing here? Yes, I'm Mark Mullins of, with Global Tech Design, 45 Wintonberry Avenue, Bloomfield, um, for 3 Park Avenue. And here in Bloomfield, that's near the intersection of um, Park Avenue and uh, Blue Hills Avenue, uh, I think it's Route 178. The proposal is, you see that structure, it's a two-story structure, and it was in the past approved for as a business, as also residential, it's in a gateway zone. And it was a hair salon on the first level and a dwelling on the second level. Um, what the new owners purchased that structure and what we're proposing to do, the second level did not have privacy for a dwelling. So what we're proposing to do is to separate the egress. Um, so we'll have the existing egress, which is on the left-hand side of the diagram. You'll see the access going up to the- We have a picture. Um, I, I'm on my cell phone because I had to leave my office because I didn't know what time we were going to get. Okay, on. Let me see if I if I can bring it up. Um, I'm so thank sorry. You. Yeah. I wasn't sure if you were going to get to me, so I um, I left. Okay. Joyce, did you have a question? You have your hand up. You're, you're, you're muted. In there. She's muted. Joyce, you're muted. Uh, I'm, I'm, I wasn't clear on the last name. Mullins, M-U-L-L-I-N-G-S. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Um, one one moment. I'm trying to get a picture of. Oh, can we have a better system? I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to just share. Yeah, yes. That's a strange piece of land. Wonder what. Um, if I may. Hold on, I have Street View, and I just want to bring up GIS as well. Thank you. Thank you. This map. Here it is. All right, I'm almost there. Bear with me. Screen save. So I'm going to share a couple of screens with you. First, this is the subject parcel. Um, a 2020 aerial photo from GIS. These are the boundaries it's showing. This is the existing structure. This is uh, in the back, there's uh, access via ramp um, and also in there and in the front through here. This is a walkway to the existing main entrance there. Um, I also want to show you the site survey that was submitted um, recently, a few days ago of the property. Um, I do that now. Let's, let's go back for a moment. Oh. Hello again. This is, this is the site survey. So as you could see, this is the frontage of the property where I was showing you um, mm -hmm. Uh, it's really hard. It's a very unique lot, but this is the frontage of the property. Um, this is the setback of 25 feet um, front yard setback. The, summer, the front setback, okay. Yeah, yep. you see the setback here. Uh, yeah. this, this is the existing porch and uh -huh. this is the existing walkway. This is a proposed walkway, the proposed stairway, and um, the landing here 
for a new proposed entry door. Um, so I'm going to go back to the aerial, uh, the street image of the property. So you have a visual of the front of the property now. So, um, this is uh, quite challenging right now. Okay. Okay, here it is. Um, that's this is the frontage that it's shown on the site survey. This is the existing entrance. This is where they want a secondary um, uh, entryway. So this so they, way, they want both entryways? Yeah, they want a separate, um, you know, uh, is my understanding. And I'm not sure if it's because they're separated inside or, you know, if this goes to a different use or not. Um, but as you can see, um, this is a covered entryway. And in the site survey, it shows you this definitely uh, projects, it's outside of, it's within the front yard setback. So the reason for uh, their variance is to allow for a second entryway that is within the setback as well. Um, so it's, it's a non-conforming, in addition of a non-conforming uh, entryway. Um, even if they expand it this way and it would be one entryway, it would still expand the footprint right. of the non-conforming. So that is why we're here before you. Right. Um, and so my understanding is that they want two separate entryway, which was the site plan that you just uh, I recently shared. Um, if I can get back to it. Can you see that? Um, not sure, are you able to see this plan that I'm sharing? Yes. We're just seeing the picture of the front. Yeah. Uh, how about now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All this, right, so. This is, this is the existing porch. Um, and so it doesn't have, so it, it looks like uh, it looks like they want to have two separate, but that um, it wouldn't come out further than than what they have for the first one. It's just that it's non-conforming, so we're expanding it. Exactly, exactly. Correct. That's mm -hmm. exactly. Madam Chair. Okay, okay, okay. Just so we're all on the same page, go ahead and um, go back and. Um, can you know continue with what you were saying more? Yes, thank you. And uh, let me apologize. I, as I said, I had to leave the office because I wasn't sure if you're going to get to me. But yes, yeah, so what happens is on the the existing egress on the left hand side, um, that's going up to the residential area. So there was no privacy there. So we want, just want to create that privacy. So when um, we're apply, dealing with clients down below um, on the first level we're not necessarily the invasion of privacy. That's what we're trying to provide. So we just want to have a um, independent egress um, to the first floor and one for the second level. That's what we're requesting our proposal is. And there isn't any other place you can do that besides in the front there? Unfortunately, no, no, that's uh, because what we did in the back, we had to reconfigure the back for handicap accessibility to come into the into that area. And that was done original with the original owner. So that was not taken into consideration. Um, so now we do need that. Yes. You do have an entrance in the back, a handicap. Yes, entrance? that's where the handicap comes in through. Yes. For handicap accessibility. Can't everybody just come in through there instead of having another entrance in the front? Well, that's the challenge because it would be so costly to restructure 
that whole area in the back. And when we looked at the, the did a feasibility study on it, we realized that the front would be the most adequate way to come through uh, to get to that area. But you still have to have the accessibility in the back. There's something I'm missing, I guess. Okay. If you already have an entrance in the back that's accessible for uh, handicap accessible, why do you need another entrance in the front that isn't going to be accessible? I, I think no, no, he was no, no, saying no. for the privacy. I think it was a privacy issue. Right. Right, but there's another way in. So why? Okay. What I'm what I'm saying the the first. The, the door on the left, the access on the left. Correct. Is for, for example, I want to live on the second level. Okay. And so getting in there, I don't need to see all the clients down below that we're dealing with for the hair salon. So the problem we have before, you could see folks going up and down, going to their residence. So that's why we have to separate that. That's why we're doing it that way. That way. At the same time, we're making it also very curb appealing with this, um, the new look that we're proposing. Um, okay. And I wish I had a chance to show the renderings and so forth, but uh, I'm, I'm not at my, my office to do that. Okay, right. so Shirley, I think you were next, but then I think Linda had something she wanted to say as well. So we'll go with okay, Shirley just, and then Linda. I just want to ask a question. Um, Jackie, I'm kind of with you. I don't understand why a, a, another front entrance, because you can't park on Park Avenue there. You have to right. park in the back of the building. Right. So even if you're you're renting the top floor, you still got to park in the back and go up the back steps unless you walk all the way around. So I'm not sure why you need the second entrance when you already for, have when you already have one in the back. You get out of your car and you just go in the in the back. So what we're trying to do, if if I may just explain it again, even with the the rear entrance and the front entrance, is designed to accommodate the clients. That's what we're trying to. A piece so we're not interfering for scoring or residential space on the second level and we do as as a business person we're trying to make sure we can we're not interfering we're trying to separate the two even though we we have to coexist and i think it lends to showing that you know we are providing privacy for the um, residents there as well as for the business. And it's if you see the interior, you will probably understand what I'm trying to say. So we would not suggest it or even propose it if we didn't think it was something that was uh, something that was worthy to be done. So okay. that's why we are proposing that. Yeah, it's it's we just want to have it separated from our business. That's so, what we're, okay, we're pleading the entrance, let me try this again because maybe I'm sure. Trying, so, the entrance that's existing now in the front means that the people that are going to their private quarters have to go through like a waiting room or something for the other. Yes, that's correct. Uh, so, why don't you yes. close off that entrance and just make an entrance that's going to go straight up? What, for example, if, 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 if I guess, in the front. What, so, Madam Chair, if, if a visitor comes to visit me, they're not coming through the rear entrance, they're coming to the front of my house. I understand. So that's that. what we're trying to accomplish, right? So even if I close off the back, even if I'm coming into my house from the back, going up through the rear, it's a, it's a very tight little area to get up to the rear, from the rear. So when I have families or friends coming over, I usually utilize the front entrance, and I think that would be the better way to really address you're, that you're issue than taking them up. through the rear. But you're not, they have you're not the getting what I'm saying. <laughs> no, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. No. Pardon, pardon me. I, I do understand clearly what you're saying. What I'm, what I'm trying to suggest, we could close off that area, yeah. but at the same time, if I'm handicapped, um, if I'm handicapped and I need access, I'm going to come through the ramps and coming yeah. to that waiting area in the back. Right. But at the same time, I'm now interfering with me going into the, because it's a common area there now. 
I'm going to open it up as a common ear if I do that. And that's what I'm, we're trying to prevent. That's all I'm trying to prevent, yeah. Alan, I think you had a question. Yeah, so on the first floor is the beauty salon? That's correct. And on the second floor is your apartment? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so when you walk in the back, you come into a, a waiting room for the salon and there must be a staircase that goes upstairs? That's correct. Okay, so you can't, you can't reconfigure the interior so that you can go upstairs that way and the same with the front? We could do that, but the cost to actually do that as opposed to doing the front entrance, it's a lot different. I don't so know. It's, yeah. Yeah. Why can't, it, okay, it, so it, in the front, and, in the front yes. why can't you go enter on the far right where that single window is? And that would push you back 25 feet. Because where that is, that's where the restrooms are. So that wouldn't work in that well, what's area. What's by that bay window? What's behind the bay window where you're proposing to open the door? Open, so a good question. Uh, it's an open area. It used to be the living area slash dining that looks from front to back. So that bay area is the, really where all the, um, the units are going to be for the hair salon. So if I sit where the bay area is, where the whole um, salon area is, when I look to where the existing doorway is, all you see is the stairs going right up. So we just want to create that privacy. So if you come in where that bay window is, you're going to go right up a flight of stairs to the bedroom? To the that's the No, no, no. Where the bay area is, is where the business is. That's what we're trying to do, separate the where the bay area is as opposed to where the existing um, door is on the left-hand side. Oh, and then you, the, the existing door would be his, they would reconfigure that. Correct, my apartment. Up. That's correct. So I yeah. still don't understand why we just don't leave the back entrance for the customers and the front entrance for, for, the, private, right. for the private entrance to the apartment. That's what I. That's what I'm not understanding. Okay, so all right, so let me. Okay, let me let me explain this way. The, the existing egress that we have right now to the left, that goes straight upstairs. That goes upstairs to the dwelling. Which, there okay. is an opening Which that. Entrance? There's an opening there that, way it was designed originally, it was an open ear. So when I come in through that main that existing store door, when I look at it, that would be the living room to my right. It was an open space. So because it's we're now separating the two as a business and dwelling, we just want to make sure that access to the my apartment on the second level, I have a free flow without interfering with what's where the bay window is, if I may explain it that way. Yeah. Linda. That's um, what I'm trying to explain. Staff, Are you staff planning to do are you planning to put a wall in? Like if yes, there's going to be a wall. Exactly. There will be a wall there. That's correct. It's a separate wall. So okay. I'm not seeing the folks when um, service is being provided to them. I have my own egress. And then where the bay window is, where that new uh, proposed egress is, that would be just for the clients coming in there. Okay. So we're not interfering. And, and I the idea again, I, if I may emphasize, Madam Chair, just real quick, is when I have a family or guests come over to visit me, you don't want to be bringing them to a little winding area. Your front entrance is where we usually uh, welcome folks through. So, you know, we're trying to accomplish both of those. Okay, so if you put a put a put um, another entrance to the business where the bay window is, is that entrance going to match the one that's on the left? That's correct, yes. It will have a little canopy just like the one there, yes. Okay. There's, um, there's plans to indicate that. Okay. okay, so I wanted to get Linda's take on this as a staff. For... <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, it's ultimately up to the board. Um, right, but I mean, does staff have issues with this? Is it because it is non-compliant to begin with, or I mean, um, I mean, did you look inside the house, Linda? I have not. That was just my question uh, to Mr. Mullins, um, whether or not, um, you know, there's it's possible to have an entryway into the salon through there with the wall, you know, with with the door indicating the salon. Um, I, I don't know, you know, uh, personally what what Mr. Mullins hardship uh, would be. I, I know he mentioned the privacy of, of the business. So that's something, you know, for the board to consider. Um, the parking is in the rear. Uh, there is access in the rear, um, even if it's, um, you know, through a hall and then getting in there. Um, you do have that access point. Um, it's not, you know, something that is required by building codes. So it's not like there's an immediate safety issue requiring uh, the entrance in the front beside uh, privacy if we want to get really technical. Um, so, uh, you know, you're, you're going to have an, another similar entrance, maybe just a bit smaller. The footprint of it looks a little smaller. I'm not sure how that scale, it's really hard to say how it's really going to look, um, you know, design wise, uh, whether or not it's going to form a little contrast there. It's is it going to be, enough. yeah, is it going to be exactly the yeah. same? Is it going to be? It's, yes. Uh, we don't the, have that. Um, yeah, we don't have any drawings. But the plans, yes, yeah, the plans are, the plans have been submitted. The, the front will, what we're trying to do is um, to replicate exactly what you see there now. So it would be two little um, gable end entrance roofing to enter that section without, just imagine it without, just moving the one to the left, to the right, without the bay. So it would just be doors there. Right, we understand that. Yeah, that I do. We understand this is getting rid of this bay and, and that. Right. Be right there. Yeah. That but there are plans. Yes. Yeah, so the plans have been submitted. Yes. If, yeah. It would be nice to keep a window um, in the front just for aesthetic purposes of the mixed use. Um, so it doesn't fully look, you know, uh, yes. without that transparency. Uh, my suggestion would be that if that is the case, expand this a little and just add the door here another I, know, I, like, know. I was wondering like, about that can we can we just you know move the door so it just kind of looks uh like a duplex would yes sure. correct and and keeping a, a, a more of a, a window area just so okay. that you have the both uh, the feel of a residential property and a mixed-use property i just hate to um you know have it uh completely look um you know, without. This is one I was wondering things. myself if you could just expand that landing and have two doors, one going to the residence that would go right upstairs, and one going to uh, right. the business. Kind of move to the it. Right. right. It'll be just expanding it a little bit, um, you know, and, and maybe moving the doors. Uh, so it meets code at the same time. I know that you know when you open a door, you have to have a certain amount of, of angle. Um, now I know they have an ADA and ramp in the back, so I mean that I don't know if it's accessible upstairs or or what the case is. It's really hard. We don't know what the layout of, of the inside right. is and what the real need of a uh, the second entry um, uh, to the business if we really are going to start using the front versus you know. Right. So Madam Chair, if I may just suggest some, the, the, what the plans have, that have been submitted has a door in that area and they have windows on either side of it. Because we did look at both the, the architecture on Park Avenue and as also those on uh, Blue Hills Avenue, because we wanted to make sure we blended in with whatever the curb appeal on both sides. So that's what we're trying to accomplish. So there are windows there on either side. So uh, Jennifer had a question. Sure. Jennifer. I, I do. I, I got a little lost. <laughs> so help me with this because are you saying that the door that's there now, the egress that's there now, mm -hmm. that's the side you're going in and then the side where the bay 
window is that's the side the customers are going to go in? That's or correct. Was it? That's correct. That's okay, correct. Then I, yeah. I, okay, I got it. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, I got, I got something. Go ahead, Alan. Yeah, so when you walk in this front door, there must, there's a staircase and a door that goes up to your apartment? Sure, the, the existing door that's there, as soon as you open it, immediately there's a stairwell that goes straight up. That's correct. Okay, so you can't put a door on that because it says private residence and people can go into the salon? And that's the that's the awkwardness of 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 that, uh, okay. because we want to make sure it's separated. You know, think of you having your home, and then you also have an operation there below. You really want to separate the two. As a matter of fact, um, the prior owners had that challenge, and they <laughs> had their residence upstairs, and it was a it was a little cumbersome. So. We now wanted to make sure we don't run into that kind of really weird setup. So, you know, I don't really want to see the customers down below. We just want to go up to our dwelling area upstairs. upstairs. Right. So that's why we're trying to separate that. And if we do it in the back, where there's a little waiting area in the back. That's going to also interfere. So that's what we're trying to separate the two entities. Okay. So yes. where I'm headed right now is I'm trying to find a way to vote for this. Right. We, and the, is there a legal hardship here? The legal hardship can't be monetary. Right. So, no, so it's, it's, it, it's, it's, you can't say it'll cost too much to change right. the interior. But I, I, I clearly understand that. I, I was just suggesting based on a comment that was made. And so the, because we are over the encroaching over the buildable line, we're requesting permission to create another egress that would be matching the existing one with just separate entrance to the business and a separate one for- What's your hardship? So my hardship is that we are encroaching almost 17 feet. No, 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 no. Well, it's why a 17 foot step encroach? back. We're stepping- we're is, encroaching. Why do you want to encroach? I want to encroach so that we can have um, a much more easier access going into our structure. Okay. So the, yes. the other part of my comment was going to be, and I'm a newbie here, but what I've noticed is that in the last few meetings that we've had, decisions of um, granting variances over the years have come back to bite us. Mm -hmm. And this is a gateway zone, which has a much stricter uh, zoning regulations. So by my question that's in the back of my mind is, so by us allowing another entrance and and going past the, the uh, zoning regulations, what's going to happen down the road? I mean, I can't, I can't say what's going to happen down the road, but I'm afraid of what we're creating where I think you have an alternative, although you don't like it, is to reconfigure the interiors, either the front door or the back door. That's oh. where I stand. <laughs> okay. Okay. Jennifer, do you still have your hand up from before or do you have another question? I have another question. Okay, go ahead. I, I, I wanted to know how, how frequently do your uh, customers or clients go in through the front? That's the direction they use most of the times, because the handicap ramp at the back, it, it's a very lengthy one, it's almost 40 feet of ramp. Um, so most times they come through the front doors. Okay. Yes, that's the way they've they been. You can't just, there's no stairs in the back, it's just the ramp? It's a ramp, it's a ramp that goes all the way. Can we see the back the again, the door. Linda, or no? Yeah, you, I think there might be one little stoop there, but I think it's a uh, ramp most of the times. Let me see if this has a more of an image, an aerial from the top, because it sometimes gives you a, a better 2021. All right, yeah, give me one second. I am going to see. See, um, okay. Can we zoom on that or no? Not really. Uh, 
No, this is okay. Okay. Hard. So, it looks, looks like this is a there's a landing here. I don't know if it's because of that. Do you have to wind your way to get to that to get to where she's got the arrow? That's yeah. correct. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and okay. It's, it's and, easier getting to the front than the the rear. <laughs> Well, but you got to park in the rear. You can't park on Park Avenue. Um, if, Madam Chair, if I, I, I kind of liked, I kind of liked what Linda was saying. Is that something that might be feasible about expanding um, the the entrance in the front now and okay. having two doors there instead of instead of um, I, I think it's I, aesthetically, I think that's going to look very strange having two entrances in the front of that house. I mean, that's that's just my opinion, but aesthetically, I think it's gonna look strange. And, if, and her idea, which was to expand uh, what you have there and have two doors there and one going to one and one going to the other, to me seemed like, like a compromise. Yeah. Madam Chair, can I ask a question then? Yes. If we were to go with um, Ms. Jennifer's proposal, is that something you would consider or this commission would consider? Um, but whatever we do, we just need two entrances at the front. Uh, we know we're encroaching, but we can probably work and expand the, the landing a little bit. So we have um, a separate egress. Okay, that, that, was, that was Linda who had suggested that. Linda, Sorry, yes, okay. Enforcement right. officer. Linda, would you be willing to work with him to try to do that? I would be, and as long as it does not, you know, extend more forward, uh, the encroachment isn't closer to the front of the property. Right, line. but it's going to probably need to extend um, a little bit a more, little bit more. Side, so it's going to be point. wider, which is still encroaching, but but I think less so. I, I mean, I, I, I would think that's uh, very doable if, if the commission finds that. I know, as you mentioned, this is a gateway district. There are desired guidelines that you have to follow and, um, and it really has to be uh, aesthetically pleasing. And I, I don't know, you know, yes, it's something that we can work on. Um, now, the challenge would be on how you would like to vote on that to expand uh, the, the existing structure. Um, to allow for a second entrance, um, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Well, how, or, or how, far, how far ahead, is that uh, from? How far is that from the uh, back now? The the door that's there. And we have a measurement from the door to the road to the property line. Well, I think it's the stoop. I mean, you've got to go up those stairs, so you're going to increase the size of the stairs. Yeah, We're not going to go any further, though. Do we have a measurement here. Was it, didn't we see a site plan or something? Yeah, let, let me look at the survey. It doesn't have the dimensions. I mean, um, there is a scale, which is really hard because it's electronically and we won't be able to scale it. So I'm not going to be able to give you an exact yeah. uh, scalable uh, front entrance. Um, but I am going to share with you the survey and you can have an idea of. Yeah, of, the, yeah. Um, let me share. Hold on one second. Uh, there it is. So this so is. Yeah, so this is the yep. Yeah, this is the line right here where the uh the setback is, um, yeah. and this is how much it extends out. Again, uh, if I had an a copy um of the actual you know a plan here, I would be able to scale it. Um, or or Mr. Uh, Mullins, if if you have. Uh, the measurements, uh, can you tell us? I don't us? have the measurements in front of us. I indicated I left the office and because I wasn't sure if this was going to happen. I have all the information there. Mm -hmm. But it, it, the width of it, I think it's, it goes, it's eight feet right now. The existing width of the, the landing right now is just about eight feet. Is there a way here? we That's can two. continue this okay. next month and maybe work out the dimensions? Well, I mean, Madam, Madam Chairman, I think that, uh, well, I think yeah. the, building, the, the building department really has to get involved in this on what's right. permitted in the doorway. I think the, the cleanest way to do this is to deny it or vote on it and it gets denied if it gets denied. And then 
if, if the building department comes back and says, yeah, I just cut a doorway in here and you got a big enough stoop, then he's done. He doesn't have to come back to us. Oh, you mean the existing the existing landing can fit both doors is what you right. mean? And it's doable right. by the building code? Right. It will but be if we do it the other way by continuing it, we might have more answers. And that way we're not denying it and he can't come back right away to us. Okay. That's the I mean, that, that's the only thing I can think of. I'd unless... rather, yeah, I, it's, to continue it would make more, more sense. Um, I mean, in my opinion. Come and on. then they can work, he can work with building and maybe you can help give him some advice as well. I mean, that's, that's what I think we should do. I, I... We can have a better understanding of the inside too. Um, right, right. What's, you know, how far from the door are the stairs? Um, yeah. That's what I'm concerned about is what is the, what does the inside look like if we're putting another door there? Right. Well, that, that would, um, I mean, that would definitely give us more answers and, and, and a scaled plan with how big that landing is, where the, where the stairwell is it right behind there. I, I think we'd have a lot, a lot more answers if we continued it for a month. Okay. If Mr. Madam Chair, before you continue, I just want to share the, the landing itself is eight feet by three feet. And then when you step inside, when you open the door and step inside, it's just about three feet to where the stairs starts, just almost. Right. So give you an idea. So what we're doing, the, the proposed landing or stoop that we're trying to create was only about five feet wide by the same three feet. That's what we're proposing. Correct. So if we are to use, do a continuance you to consider putting the entrance next to the existing entrance, then, you know, if, um, if I plead with you to allow us to do that, so give it some study and sure, I'd appreciate that. Well, if we continue it, then we haven't denied it. So therefore yeah. you, you can come back, you know, we can, we can just, have answers to some of our questions and building might say no that that doesn't really work or or they could say it will work as as commissioner uh Bukowski said and so we'd have more answers going forward and we you wouldn't you know it would just be the one month and when we'd have to you know we'd have to you're going to need a motion either way because you're still going in unless Alan thinks perfect in the perfect world that you'd be able to fit both doors there. If you're not, and you still have to expand that porch, then you're still gonna have to get a variance from us. And that's why I'd rather continue it than deny it. Okay. That, that's my thoughts on it. All right. You want me to make a motion? Sure, Alan, you might as well be three for three. <laughs> unless somebody else wants to do it, I don't, you know. Uh, I move we table application for uh, Global Tech. Is that how I pronounce it? Design LLC for variance on um, Three Park Avenue until the next meeting, which, which is, is May 2nd. May 2nd. Do we say table or we have to continue? Continue. 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 Okay. Continue it because you've already opened the public hearing. Yeah, so can you just change, you continue, know? Continue, continue. Yeah. Okay, and do I have a second? I second. Shirley Williams. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Seth, I didn't hear you. Okay, I read his lips. Okay, so uh, that passes to continue yeah. it. All right, then we'll see you next month, Mark. Please, sure. you know, don't, you know, get down there and talk with building and talk with Linda and try to see what other things you can come up with. And we provide photos. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, if I can find my agenda somewhere. 
Uh, old business. Old business. Do we have to do that tonight, Linda? No, we do not. As you know, it really wasn't. Um, as I mentioned, I was. Um, I completely forgot that I had uh, a full week worth of training, which kind of set me back a little bit here. So I you do did not get have my email, right? I did. I did. Okay. Thank you for your comment. Yep. Yeah. And your so. Question. I mean, I, it's something we're going to work on, but we're not going to do There's it. just a few outdated things, as I mentioned. Okay. I believe the fees were outdated. Um, okay. that, and then I'd like to also get, um, before you, uh, just an accurate. Uh, uh, Make it, as I said, gender neutral. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I did get that. Yeah, no, I totally got so it. That, so that the chair could be a woman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely update it. Okay. Okay. So we'll just leave okay. that. And, there and is I'm that. not sure. I know you got the minutes today, so I'm not sure whether you've had time to review that. You can definitely table that to the next meeting. I did not look at them, but if everybody else has looked at them and read them, I, I'm okay with entertaining a motion. Surely you're must be. I, I, I'm muted. I'm sorry. Um, I haven't gotten a chance to read them. Okay, so we'll table the minutes as well. Okay. Again, um, the draft copy is still available for inspection if people just wanted to see and they would understand it's a draft. It hasn't been approved, but it still meets state statute that's being uh, available and accessible to the public. So. Okay. 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 So maybe you can put that in our packet next time so that we have it. Absolutely. Next month. Um, okay, I don't have anything else. Uh, the agenda says May 1st, it's May 2nd though, the meeting. May 1st is a Sunday. Oh, yes, you are right. Uh, the agenda has it there. Oh, <laughs> I didn't do it, but we'll make that correction. Okay, so okay. we have so a motion to adjourn. Uh, I move Jennifer and I go, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Oh. All right. Okay. And seconded, and we're all set. Yeah. 34 right. p.m. meeting adjourned. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Have a restful Thank night. You. Can you okay. turn off the recording, Linda? Linda, oh, can yes, you turn I off will. the recording? One, I will. One moment. Stop recording. Oh, I just want to tell Jackie something. One moment. Uh oh. You're going to stop recording.